All right. Welcome. Before we begin, let's I apologize. I know we were supposed to start a little while ago. We've had some important board work that we had to commence before we could start. Um, thank you for all coming. Uh, we're going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Sugars, would you take the roll? Mrs. Stratton? Here. Mrs. Fleischer? Here. Mrs. Gallagher? Mr. Greenbaum? Here. Mr. Mayor? Here. Dr. Rude? Here. Mrs. Tong? Mrs. Winters? Here. Mrs. Stern? We'll move on uh, with our agenda. We do have a uh, number of things to accomplish tonight. We're going to start with recognition of fall sports student athletes, Dr. Morton. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I am uh, pleased and excited to be here tonight with some outstanding young people uh, from two of our middle schools. Tonight, we're gonna recognize our Beck Middle School girls soccer team and our Carusi Middle School field hockey team. I'm gonna ask Ms. Wilson to come on up and join me up at the, uh, at the podium. We'll take it from there. All right, so we did our uh, recognition a little bit in reverse order tonight in the interest of time. So our athletes already have their certificates. Uh, we took their picture already, which is usually done at the end of the uh, recognition, but we're going to have our coaches come up, say a few words about the season, read off their names and uh, get them recognized as they expect it to be this evening. So we will start with Beck Soccer and Ms. Katie Boyle, coach. Uh, good evening. My name is Kate Boyle, and I'm the girls' soccer coach at Beck. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Morton and the members of the Board of Education for having us here this evening. Um, we're so excited to be here and to be recognized by the Board of Ed. Um, our girls had a phenomenal season this year, and we went 12-0. and We were undefeated uh, for the first time in, in recent history, um, as long as I've been around. Um, in our championship game, we beat Voorhees for the third time this season. It was 1-0. We scored towards the very end of the, the, end of the game to make it a little bit of a a little bit of a heart attack, but a successful game. And, you know, the girls worked hard all year and we're really proud of them. Um, in terms of some season highlights, uh, we outscored our opponents uh, 41 to 5. So for every eight goals we put in, we only let up one. Our defense, uh, was in, uh, in addition to our goalies, uh, had nine shutouts in our 12 games. So 75% of our season, we uh, kept our opponents scoreless. Um, our leading scorer was Emma Weiss this year. She's one of our eighth graders and one of our captains. Uh, she had 10 goals and eight assists. Our second leading scorer was our other captain, Joey Mateo, who had four goals and three assists. We had a lot of contributors um, on our roster of 19 players. We had 15 different girls score a goal, which was a tremendous accomplishment. So we just want to say thank you for having us. Girls, phenomenal season. Congratulations. And we can't wait for next year. All right, at this time, I'd like to recognize the members of the team. Uh, seventh graders, uh, Marlena Brumbaugh. Come on, come on over. Uh, Samantha Heskin, Taylor Park, Emmy Pavinsky, and Marissa Zwieben. Eighth graders, Lily Balanza, Jolie Giles, Ashley Lamp, Joey Mateo, Natalie Olson, Ellie Rivera, Michaela Rosenbaum, Maddie Toole, and Emma Weiss. Unfortunately, some of our players weren't able to make it this evening due to some athletic uh, commitments, but I would still like to recognize them. We have Johanna Kang, uh, Lily Schubach, Maya Morgan, and Reagan Davis. Congratulations, girls.
Okay, now we're going to move on to Carusi Field Hockey under the direction of Coach Bridget Schaefer. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Morton and the Board of Ed for having us here tonight. Carusi Middle School Field Hockey team had a fun, exciting, and successful season in 2023. The Mustangs are undefeated in league play and only allowed one goal from all opponents. Goalies Evie Sakalis and Brennan Peters, along with our stellar defenders, including our sweeper Shyla Henry, combined for nine total shutouts. Mm. Top scorers were eighth grader Emily Danaskis and seventh grader Audrey, Audrey Kosmoshevsky. <laughs> eighth graders. Amelia Johnson, Genevieve Lenny, and Lily Joy led the Mustangs with total points, both scoring goals and contributing assists. Mustangs outscored all opponents 42-2 to two, with goals coming from 11 players. Amaya DeBenny, Riley, Fallon Lewis, and Ava Legato controlled the midfield throughout the season for the Mustangs with their consistent play. The squad finished the regular season with a 10-0 record, earning the first seed spot in the SJSL playoffs. Carusi hosted the semifinal round of the playoffs, rolling over Glenn Landing at home with a score of 5-0. Carusi met Voorhees in the South Jersey Sports League Championship game for the third consecutive year, however, the first season with home field advantage. The Mustangs came from behind, going down a goal early in the second half. We forced a 7v7 overtime period. Amelia Johnson scored the winning goal on a Mustang penalty corner to lead the team to victory. Okay, girls, when I call your name, you guys come up. Macy Bonanno. Elizabeth Boyle, Ava Criaris, Emily Danaskis, Amaya Deveni, Riley Fallon Lewis, Shyla Henry, Ella Hutchinson, Amelia Johnson, Lily Joy, Audrey Kosnoshevsky, Ava Legato, Genevieve Lenny, Nadia Longo, Brennan Peter, Jamari Rodriguez, Sloan Schmidt and our two that are were not able to make it tonight, Sophia Springer and Evie Sakalis. Congratulations, girls. Of course, you're all welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if your homework is done. All right, so to all students, thank you. Congratulations, parents. Thank you for bringing your children out, for supporting them. I know how difficult it is sometimes as a sports parent, um, as one of three kids. Um, thank you. Thank you for them, because they probably don't thank you enough. Um, again, you are also welcome to stay. We're, we'll be here for a while. But we understand if you have other things to do. Have a good evening. We're gonna move on now to uh, presentations. We're gonna start with board member recognition. Two of our board members, Jen Fleischer, Corinne Elmore Stratton. This is their last meeting. Um, so this is an, our opportunity um, to recognize their service, uh, not just to the board, the administration, the students. Um, we would normally withhold our comments until the end. I will do that for Mrs. Elmore Stratton. I understand Ms. Fleischer does have to leave early, um, but I will go last. So we will just move on. Does, does anyone else wish to make any statements? You want to, the mic is yours for Ms. Fleischer before Dr. Morton takes the mic. Ms. Winters. Jen, I want you, I want to just thank you from my heart, and I've said this to you, but I want to say it in public, for teaching me 
how to lead with class and style, how to bring people together when they seem miles apart, and how to always, always be a clear and calming presence. I hope to emulate you. We're wonderful. We'll miss you. Mr. Greenbaum. So, Jen, I have really enjoyed working with you this year. Uh, you really have an amazing ability not just to listen, but to really hear when, when we talk and when others speak with you um, and incorporate it into whatever it is we're working on. Um, I certainly gave you a hard enough time with PL when I had concerns with policies, and you always turn those concerns into, into meaningful discussions and really positive outcomes. Um, you're someone who's always been dedicated to, to serving the community, whether it's through your work on the board, the zone, your other volunteer work. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure working with you, and I wish you the best. Any other board members? Dr. Rude. <laughs> Uh, we're part of the same uh, same incoming class of uh, board members. I appreciate that um, you've always just had a been a steady uh, voice on uh, P and L. Um, I don't think I could give it the same kind of attention to detail that you do. I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate uh, in the room and outside the room your kindness and just the way you navigate the world, uh, treating people so well. Um, and you'll be missed. So thank you for your service. Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Ms. Feischer, it's been a pleasure to serve with you. And uh, the good thing is we don't uh, have to say a permanent goodbye. You're, you're gonna be still doing all the amazing work that you're doing now and really excited and just thankful for you to continue to give back to our community. It's very needed, very wanted. And also, thank you for having a cheat sheet for me every meeting. <laughs> so, um, of course, thank you um, for your service, for teaching all of us um, how to help evaluate issues and problems, um, how to identify better solutions. Um, you've been a huge part of some of the uh, amazing successes that this board and this district has had for the students, um, especially just this last year, whether it be full, full day, uh, free pre-K, uh, high impact tutoring, uh, the, 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 the commencement of the bond project. Um, none of these things would have happened without the support, uh, often the guidance that you've provided to us um, inability to craft messages to the community, um, your support, your insights, your expertise um, have been um, truly valued, will be missed. Thankfully, we have reason to believe you're staying in the Cherry Hill community um, and we'll would, would, would call on that guidance from time to time. Um, so thank you. Um, Sorry to see you go. Understand that there are there are other pastors out there, and we look forward to your assistance um, to the district in whatever form that can be. Thank you. So I've learned that the greatest resource that we have as in individuals um, happens to be the time that we have. Our, our time is limited here on this earth, and our, our time is is not uh, you know infinite. Uh, how one chooses to spend their time reflects the values that an individual has and what they prioritize. And, you know, I've seen firsthand the countless number of hours that um, Splicer, you've dedicated to the children of this community. Uh, Ms. Elmore Stratton, the same for you as well. I've seen the countless hours that you, you, you've given, uh, which reflects exactly what you believe. You know, our children are the heart of this community and you've given your time to see them prosper to see them uh, move forward and to see them benefit. So for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I have the uh, utmost admiration, respect and appreciation for you both. Um, we have plaques for you. Ms. Elmore Stratton, I know your comments are coming later, but I'm gonna give you your plaque as well uh, this evening.
um, appreciate Mr. Mayor for going off script and letting me do everything a little bit early and Dr. Uh, Morton too. Um, I do have to leave a little early tonight, um, but I did want to take the chance, uh, the time to thank everybody and thank all my board members. What beautiful comments and also the student reps. You've been amazing. Um, thank you for your support and all of your efforts. Um, it's been wonderful to work with both of you. Um, and I do want to say um, I feel very honored to have worked with this group. And that has been, um, someone just asked me what was my you know, greatest thing I thought I accomplished. And I really think us all working together to move this district forward in a positive manner is really what I started out to try to do. And I hope that I've made that happen by different you know, projects that we've had. Um, but I just wanna say it's been an honor serving the Board of Ed and uh, thank you all for, for your support and confidence. And I really do look forward to working in a different capacity uh, for Cherry Hill. I'm very excited. And I wish everybody a peaceful holiday season and a happy and healthy new year. So thank you. So uh, Ms. Fleischer, anyone who knows me knows I don't do scripts. So your ask to move this along quickly was obviously gonna sit easily with me. Um, uh, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, we will um, will embarrass you a little bit later in the meeting, so you have to sit sit for that. Um, we will move on now to um, the remainder of our agenda. We do have uh, two presentations. We are going to start uh, with the student safety data presentation. So, Mr. Um, Saparito, if you would kindly take the podium, the room is all yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Board members, Dr. Morton, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, before I get started, I would like to thank Mrs. Elmore Stratton, Ms. Fleischer, for your support in the campus police program and, and for uh, you know, uh, me personally. Uh, it's, uh, it's been wonderful to work with you both, so thank you. Every year, uh, we have to do the... Okay. <laughs> wow, that, that really was quick. Uh, every year, uh, we, uh, I present to the board the student safety uh, data system and report on the information that's been gathered on the previous completed school year. So this would be the 22-23 school year. And I'll tell you something, trying to put this together and keeping the school years to, in the right order while you're working in another school year, uh, you got to make sure that all the numbers are correct. Send it to Dr. Morton. So, of course, if there's any issues, it, it ends up being his fault anyway, because he loved that. I'm just kidding, of course. I think we got everything squared away. Mark? Just a reminder, not that we need a reminder. We see a reminder every day, I believe, about the impact of COVID-19 on the district. Uh, the numbers are substantially down, as you'll see, in 19 and 20. I believe it was March 13th of uh, 2020, no, I'm sorry, 2020, when we shut down initially. And then the rest of that year, uh, was basically either out or uh, remote learning uh, as a choice of, uh, of academics. So we were very low there, uh, 20, 2021 school year also was affected by COVID in the beginning of the year and basically through that whole year also. Uh, so you will see that the numbers will reflect that. I think it's the next slide. Uh, you, you will see though a little higher number on the HIBs and the HIB alleged in those two school years, those two academic years because HIV and HIV alleged can happen and is reported off of school grounds. So uh, either by uh, when we were all in uh, online and cyber learning, if there was any sort of, of uh, incident that rose to that particular uh, uh, burden of proof for HIV and HIV alleged, that's why those numbers are a little bit higher than the incidents for those COVID years. Like I said, the SSD report submitted each year at a, at a public meeting. Uh, the annual report reflects the summary of the incidents. At one point, we had a very, very robust subcategories to these six categories that you see up here on the screen. But when we switched from the EVVRS, which was the Electronic Violence and Vandalism System, 
to this, the state never followed through with those subcategories. So violence would be broken down into certain subcategories. Vandalism would, weapons would. They still are, but they're just not reported. That data isn't captured, so it could be extracted and reported on. Uh, it could, if you looked at each singular piece of paper and did little tick marks like we used to do. Why that hasn't happened, I don't know. I emailed them when originally and asked them. They said they were working on it, and it has been six years now. So this would be a great project they're working on. Uh, the type of incidents, like I said, are under those six, six categories. Violence, vandalism, weapons, and substances are the ones that uh, have to do with the safety, um, you know, the, the, the safety of the students and the school in, in those particular areas. And of course, the harassment, intimidation and bullying, and then the alleged, which just got added about five years ago, again, impacting the uh, safety and security of the students, especially student learning day. Mark. Just as a review, I took most of the reviews out from this year's uh, presentation because they haven't updated anything. The, the, the newest updates, I, though I kept up there, was that the HIV alleged category was added to the uh, SSDS. And the substance, they, they changed up a little bit. Uh, there's two categories. There's a substance use confirmed, which means a student would get sent out for testing and would come back confirmed, uh, either uh, alcohol or some uh, controlled substance. And then there's a substance use suspected, refused exam, and the right to refuse the exam. Before, if you refu refuse the exam, that, that wasn't a category. It just went in as confirmed or, or as use. So they changed the wording a little bit to separate it out to show that there is a, a mechanism in there to refuse the exam. Mark. Here's the numbers. As you see, the, the violence, vandalism, weapons, and substance use uh, in HIV on the left-hand side there. We'll, we'll address HIV alleged in a moment. Uh, the, the numbers are way down for the top four categories there uh, for violence uh, from the last full school year past COVID, which would have been 21-22, down uh, 23. Uh, vandalism, almost non-existent. Weapons, way down four. All four of those weapon incidents are uh, blades of some sort that were found in possession of a student. They were not used. They were not displayed. They just happened to be on their possession for whatever reason. Substance use 33 down a little bit and uh, HIV confirmed up just a little bit. Uh, you can see the numbers in red of the COVID numbers, the 2021 school year, there was basically nothing. Uh, of course we had 1920, we had, September through March of school. So that's why the numbers are a little bit higher there before we were shut down for COVID. HIV alleged, as you can tell, it's way, way up in 22, 23. Uh, 170 is to 88, the last other comparable year, 18, 19, 94. Uh, HIV training programs are required uh, to be tracked and reported to the DOE. Uh, District-wide, uh, 174 HIV training programs were conducted in the 22-23 academic year across all buildings. If I may, Mr. Mayor, I, th I, I, wanted, I want to comment a little bit on that number uh, being so high. We are starting to feel the effects of the juvenile justice reform in, in, this, in, the, in the academic arena. It's taken a little bit to, to go full circle. Now, that being said, I fully 100% agree with juvenile justice reform. There were people that were, or children that were put into the system that should not have been put into the system. The juvenile justice system is there for cases that are absolutely needed, not, not just because somebody got mad at somebody and they got put on a juvenile petition. So what's happening now, in order to, in order to sign a formal complaint against a juvenile, it has to be cleared through the prosecutor's office. And that process is a formal uh, juvenile petition that is signed by a complainant or used to be signed by a complainant. Now it has to be signed by law enforcement. Parents cannot go to the police department, cannot come to campus police and say, we want to sign a complaint against another student. It doesn't work that way anymore just for the reason of the juvenile justice reform because it ends up being more revenge than anything else and that's not what it's there to do uh so uh, i believe it's carried over into hib 
when there isn't any uh, any mechanism for those complaints to be signed at the police department anymore. So I think that's why our HIBs are are, are up. That's my theory. It's uh, it's grounded in fact, but that's that's my theory, and that's that's where I think we're going with that. And that would give a little explanation. The experts, uh, Mrs. Webbington, not with us tonight. Um, she she would be the person to ask for the for the salient details. But from what I see and from my position here and with my my uh, my staff, that's what that's what I believe we're seeing with that number. State mandated actions. Uh, the the latest one, the first one, I should say up top, the latest one that was made is the threat assessment teams that are required to be by state law in place for this academic year. We have a threat assessment team in place. It has not yet needed to be activated. What I, I said at other board meetings when we met about it, I think it was over the summer, and what I've said at numerous different forums, threat assessment is not discipline. Threat assessment is not special education. Threat assessment is a very, very narrow focused tool to be used for actual threats. It is not a manifestation of a disability. It is not somebody getting mad on the playground and saying, I'm going to kill you. That is not what the threat assessment team is for. It is for when information is developed that leads to the, the belief and the probable cause, or at least a reasonable suspicion that there's going to be harm done at a school. And then the threat assessment team will be activated. I'm sorry, at at threat against others or themselves. So it would, it would, uh, it would include suicidal ideation. So we have not had any of them this year that we have had to do this for. So I just wanted to be clear. It's very, very narrow focused. Uh, I don't want it to, to seem like it's something that going to be used all the time and, and kids are going to be subject to it. Absolutely not. Uh, body worn cameras by campus police they're not to be well they can be worn in the building but they don't get activated in the building due to the privacy issues uh, they do have to be worn at extracurricular activities and activated whenever a situation may arise to an arrest that could be any situation so anytime that there is any sort of uh, an incident that campus police respond to at an extracurricular activity or during arrival and dismissal while they're outside of the building they're wearing their body worn cameras that's state uh, that's from the state attorney general and mark some uh, safe school practices that we have been following for a very long time uh, strong emphasis on character education mr guy uh, is uh, has been the strongest advocate i've seen of that over my my nine years here uh, an outstanding job that him and the people that he has working for him doing that and teaching the students to be responsible young adults we have an annual mandatory review of our district crisis management plan and we have to sign off on every year it is a continuing document that's never parked in one spot for a long time it's always being uh, it's always being updated and it's uh, it's very fluid uh, we have visits from cherry hill police to our campuses every day of course we have our campus police program in place at the various buildings mandatory training for campus police they have to go through Every training that police officers in the township have to go through. In fact, they do most of it with them. They have to go through de-escalation training, SRO certification, cultural proficiency, in-service training, firearms qualification. Everything that a township police officer does uh, training-wise has to be done by campus officers also. School safety specialists, continued training is required by the Department of Education. Myself and Ms. Sugars are our uh, school safety specialist. And I uh, know, Lynn, if you tried to get on that site and get your certification. Good luck. Not a very friendly process. Mark. Memorandum of agreement with Cherry Hill Police Department and Camden County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, that, uh, that document has just been updated. And when I mean just, I mean just been updated. I'll be taking a close look at that. We'll be reporting to a district leadership team, I believe in January on that. And then we'll, uh, Dr. Morton feels we need to, uh, bring me back here. I'll be more than glad to, to go over that. Uh, we have instant access to Cherry Hill Police Records Management, which which any report that campus police officers take is in within that that, that uh, CAD RMS system. And it's a um, 
instant retrieval of information if we need it, which we have done countless times. Direct communication between campus police and Cherry Hill police. Every campus police officer carries a Cherry Hill police radio. So they can monitor everything that's going on around the neighborhoods and in the, in the communities of the schools. And they can uh, have direct contact with Cherry Hill police if they need them immediately. Megan's law notification has, has been in effect for years now. Uh, they go to the principals of the building and there's a mechanism there to make sure that everybody is aware of whatever uh, Megan's law uh, information comes out. We conduct monthly security drills and fire drills as per the DOE recommendations or actually that it's the, the DOE uh, that we have to follow their, their, uh, the recommendations to do every year. The, the Department of Education's uh, safety and security and, and uh, preparedness, they, it's really not legislative. They don't really have any legislative uh, backing to them, but that they, they can and they do strongly suggest how we conduct our, our drills. And that's, that's we follow them to the letter, uh, every one of them. District-wide protocol for exterior doors and classroom doors remain locked. Of course, uh, there is no propping open of doors. We have the, the doors, uh, we can monitor the doors. We don't, we don't do that, that is a, that is a security breach. Uh, Alyssa's law compliance, direct 911 access to the police department with the push of a button. Uh, swipe card entry system, lockdown button, security cameras are in place in every building. Stop the bleed programs in place in every building. We, we keep expanding on that. Uh, involves uh, pressure and, and tourniquets and it's a um, it's a Samaritan law where if you don't know the first thing about a tourniquet but you can get it on and stop the bleeding that's exactly what you want you to do and there's Narcan in all the buildings I know there's been a little uh, some issues with that there is there is nothing that suggests that Narcan in the buildings do anything but save lives thank goodness we haven't had to use it yet but it is uh, I know we never have to use it but it is in every building case that that does come up incident command system training with cherry hill police and cherry hill fire department constant contact with chief kemp and chief Holohan, uh, almost almost every day uh, we have a resiliency program in place for campus police officers and staff if needed uh, have a trained resiliency uh, officer is uh, joe baldessera my officer that's at rosa middle school uh, he can uh, intervene in, in any issues with campus police that they're having for any incident and it is open to the staff also everybody in the community i put stakeholders up there because it's it, everybody should see it but everybody there the, the 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 weakest link in any security plan and in any security of anything is the human factor and if everybody from board of ed to the community that doesn't even have kids in the schools. Everybody in between has to follow, has to understand how important safety and security is to our school district. And uh, I, I can't even thank enough the principals uh, on a daily basis who help me out with everything. Uh, my campus police officer do an unbelievable job the safety and security teams at the high schools and the safety and security teams that are formed every year at each building. It's just a, uh, it's a great community and everybody has the safety and security of the children, staff, visitors every day as a top priority. That's it, right, Mark? Any questions from the board? Any board members have any questions for Mr. Separate or Mrs. Winters? Thank you. I just want to compliment you and all the work you do to coordinate all this among 19 schools and all of our staff and students and give a real life example of the impact of the work that you do on our students. I was blessed to be picking up a carload of students at the Rosa Dance last Thursday night, five teenage girls, and the campus police officer at Rosa was standing outside in the freezing cold. He knew every single one of those students by name. They knew him, they felt safe with him. He made sure that each of them had a ride, knew how to get to their ride, was reminding them to be careful walking into the chaotic parking lot. It was evident from the way that he did his job that he cared about those students and keeping them safe. I was so impressed and I don't think he knew who I was from Adam, 
But as a parent, I just said, you know, thank you so much for being here. And he's like, happy to do it. And it, it was just so clear that the empathetic relationships he had built with those students and the commitment to keeping them safe late on a Thursday night in the freezing cold, it really shone through. And I think that that kind of commitment to our student safety and security is evident throughout all of our schools. So I just wanted to publicly thank all of our campus police officers for the phenomenal job they do and thank you for your coordination of them. We appreciate well, it. Well, thank you for the kind words, Ms. Winters. Uh, the, the mission of campus police is completely different than the mission of a regular township police officer. That is what's supposed to be happening. They're supposed to be ingrained in the community. And that leads to all sorts of good things. Safety of the, of the, the kids leaving a dance. Safety of the kids leaving the school, coming into school every day. They know who's supposed to be there, who's not supposed to be there. Uh, and the, um, that relationship, the trust, can one day maybe glean some information that would lead to stopping something that could be harmful in a building. And that's, that's what it's all about. And I thank you again. Do any other board members have any questions for Mr. Sabrito? Um, and so, uh, Mr. Sabrito, thank you. Um, I've said similar things last year, probably as former law enforcement. Um, myself, I, you know, I recognize how difficult your job is and your team's job is and the dedication that, um, that you all take to, to get it right and get it right every day for all the students. Um, the, the, you know, their dedication, not just in showing up every day and, and, and doing it right, but also in the training um, um, shows, it shows every day. Um, the fact that, that um, these, the worst case scenario incidents don't happen um, is uh, at least in, in some large part um, attributable to your staff, to their training, to the, um, uh, to the culture that the students believe exists in that regard, um, partly because of what you do. As far as um, the human element and the weak points, obviously true, but I will say um, specifically with regard to the front office um, staff at Cherry Hill West, they have been um, trained exceptionally well. I am there twice a week for dropping off one thing or another that might have been forgotten by one of my students, my children, and I cannot get in. They know who I am, but I go through the protocol and I'm glad they do. They apologize sometimes. They should never apologize for that. And I tell them not to. They're doing their job. They take it seriously as you do. And, and thank you for all the students, for the parents that rely on you and, and your staff um, every day when they send their kids to school. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, I just want to bring up one thing about our selection process. Uh, I, I'm sure you all know last, last May we had a you know, very sad, uh, tragic loss of one of our campus police officers uh, from Carusi, uh, Officer Wayne Davis. Uh, Wayne was a great guy. He, he's one of the funniest guys I ever met. And um, he is a 25 year veteran of Pemberton Police Department and spent five years with us and, um, and passed away in May. It took us until November to find a replacement because we're not just going to hire anybody. Uh, we went through three, Dr. Morton, three candidates uh, that just did not feel were, uh, I didn't even feel that they were, they were uh, we should bring them to Dr. Morton. When we finally found it, we brought, a, brought the candidate to Dr. Morton. We would not, I will not in any way, shape or form compromise on who I put in these buildings because it's entirely too important. So Officer Sean Donlin is our newest uh, campus officer at Carusi. He's a 25-year veteran from Camden Metro. And so far, Dr. Birdie, doing a great job. It's always good to have, you know, props in the audience there. <laughs> Glad I seen him before he came up here. Anything else? No. Well, he is, um, he is, he is uh, big, big shoes, big boots to yes. fill. Yes. Um, and the fact that you are confident that he's going to do that. Um, gives us all the confidence we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for your time, everyone, and great holidays. Thank you. We will move on now to our presentation on restorative practices. Dr. Birdie, I see you're here not just to support Mr. Saperito this evening. I was going to say, uh, Tony Sap, always a tough act to follow, especially as he refers to me in the audience as a prop. 
uh, this is this is a tricky segue into our uh, into our uh, presentation. Listen, hopefully, but, you're, hopefully your agent is taking care of you, and you're getting a little something extra for the for the prop work. Because I mean, yeah, I think I'm up for the challenge. So I, I appreciate that. You are. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. I, I uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Neil Birdie. I am the proud principal at Carusi Middle School, uh, and honored to be here in front of the board tonight. Uh, presenting on restorative practices. Uh, I will say that I am merely the opening act. Uh, I've got an all-star lineup behind me here tonight, uh, and they're really going to do um, the lion's share of presenting in terms of what's happening in schools. But I thought uh, that it made sense that I would prime the pump a little bit to make sure that we had a little bit of a, uh, a, a working vocabulary around uh, restorative practices. Slide, please. Um, as important um, as knowing what restorative practices are, I think it's important to know what they're not, uh, because oftentimes uh, it becomes an all-encompassing term that that is often uh, misused or or miscommunicated uh, when we talk about it. So uh, important to note that it is not a brand new trend or fad, something that's uh, come to be in vogue recently. Uh, in fact, it was almost 20 years ago that I visited uh, the IIRP, which is the Inst Institute for Restorative Practices in Bethlehem, PA. Uh, at the time, they were working with uh, Lehigh University. Uh, and again, this work was, uh, they, they're considered the pioneers, but the work wasn't new at that time. Um, and now they are actually a full, uh, fully accredited graduate school program that offers a master's degree uh, in the social science of restorative practice. Uh, it's not a quick fix. In fact, research tells us it's something that needs to be intentional and multi-year uh, in order to work. And it is certainly not consequence free. Uh, one of the things that I hear uh, typically in my work is that uh, restorative practice is a sort of code word for uh, uh, removing or reducing code of conduct. And that, that's just simply not the case. Uh, actually, restorative practices uh, exist in concert with the code of conduct, uh, as do positive behavioral supports. Uh, it's certainly not therapy uh, and certainly not expensive. Um, it's, it's something that requires uh, professional development that's ongoing and meaningful, uh, but not something that, that costs a tremendous amount of money to implement, Mr. Plavinsky. Thank you. Um, so what are researchers uh, saying uh, about restorative practices? Uh, I think I already said it's a social science and, and it's really based in strengthening relationships um, and, and social connections in communities. Uh, evidence suggests that if you do it proactively, it improves culture and climate. Uh, and there's also a growing body of evidence that suggests that repairing harm, which is what it's based in, uh, either repairing the harm done to a person or to the environment, uh, has a significant uh, impact in reducing uh, misbehavior or uh, uh, behavior that is not uh, in line with uh, expectations. Mr. Plavinsky. Uh, from a practitioner's perspective, uh, and, and obviously the practitioners are going to talk in a minute about what's happening in our schools, uh, it really is a wide variety of activities um, that repair harm uh, and, and um, attempt to reduce uh, not only misbehavior, but also to reduce uh, exclusionary discipline. Uh, essentially, uh, what the findings suggest is that a multi-year initiative uh, you know, to reduce uh, disciplinary uh, discipline that excludes um, also reduces uh, uh, disparities in discipline as well. Um, so, so we want to look at it not only as something that's intentional, something that's multi-year, uh, something that builds community, something that uh, leans heavily on mentoring and relationships, uh, but also something that holds um, accountable uh, those uh, that uh, not only are responsible for the actions, but also give support to those that have been uh, in some way harmed by the actions. Next slide. So what are the restorative beliefs that we share uh, and that um, evidence suggests uh, lead us to these restorative schools uh, with healthy relationships? Uh, the first is a strong sense of community belonging. Uh, we talk about positive connections uh, that lead to commitments from each other uh, or norms. Uh, I'm always I'm always interested in uh, students who, for instance, uh, you know, ha have a uh, have a, a run in here or there uh, in a hallway or with a certain teacher or in a, in a, in a library or in a cafeteria. Uh, but yet the football coach doesn't see any of those behaviors. Right. Is that is that about the relationship that exists? Is it the commitment between uh, teammates? Is it uh, the notion of children holding each other accountable? Uh, well, research suggests that it's actually all of those things. Uh, and then finally, the other clarifying belief around restorative practices 
is that um, it can help uh, take uh, the responsibility um, and the accountability um, out of the actual uh, consequence. So uh, what, what we're talking about is uh, consequences are more uh, significant, more uh, valuable, more meaningful when children feel like we're working with them and not doing something to them. Uh, and that essentially is uh, the summary of what those who practice uh, restoration believe. Uh, but again, I think that the, the, the research behind it, the, the intro should be uh, lesser uh, uh, pr uh, prominent tonight. And it's really about how it's happening and how it's impacting and enhancing the lives of our children in our schools. Uh, and that's what our friends are gonna talk about. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our friends from Woodcrest Elementary. Good evening, everyone. I'm a little shorter than this, sorry about that. Um, it, thank you for having us here tonight. We are really both excited to come. We're very invested in restorative practices at Woodcrest. Um, we've seen a great benefit to the kids. So we, when we're looking at restorative practices, um, we are sharing this cycle. Um, it's not, we don't just focus on the restorative piece. Most of our time is really being proactive. So we're planning, um, we're trying to set the kids up for success. Um, the restorative piece, we support the children in, you know, understanding the skills that they need to communicate with one another, um, intra and interpersonal skills, and to help them restore um, relationships, as Dr. Birdie was talking about, when that's needed. And then there's a reflective piece, which um, we look at our programming, and we want to look at our school community and say, what do we need to do to keep growing, um, to improve on what we have now? So while all of the elementary schools and you know the 19 schools in Cherry Hill um, follow the similar process in developing, implementing, and improving our, pra our practices, um, each school has its own culture and climate and needs, which is just amazing, like when we visit other schools as well. Um, so some of the elements may vary um, in how each school meets the unique needs of their students, um, but the process is the same. Uh, next slide. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, as Dr. Birdie had referenced, uh, per a growing body of research, it's become increasingly clear that traditional methods to address discipline can thwart the development of empathy. Uh, conventional approaches tend to focus exclusively on the offender and little if any attention is given to the victims or the need to repair relationships harmed by misconduct. Uh, additionally, with traditional approaches where the deed is not sufficiently separated from the doer, there's often the unintended tendency to shame, stigmatize, and exclude students for their behavior, which creates the conditions that make it far more likely that some students will continue to reoffend. Uh, in short, as evidenced by the fall survey results uh, highlighted on this slide, these practices have served to strengthen peer-to-peer uh, student to staff and student to staff relationships, and we have enjoyed a sharp decline in office referrals and suspensions. Next slide, please. Um, this component on reducing, preventing, and improve, improving harmful behavior includes, um, if you if you look up there, you can just kind of we tried to give you a variety of things to look at, um, lessons, activities, and different initiatives that we have planned to best support our children in learning and practicing um, important inner and interpersonal skills. So some of the examples include um, the district SEL program for elementary school, which is second step. Um, the children in all elementary schools are learning about growth mindset and goal setting emotion management, empathy and kindness, and problem solving. Um, at Woodcrest, we are also in our fifth year participating in the No Place for Hate program. Um, our kids really love it and get involved in it, and this is really where we can tailor um, the lessons to what our needs are in our school. Um, those lessons include um, themes that there are three projects per year, um, challenging bias and bullying, exploring diversity, and promoting respect for others' differences. Uh, we also do classroom lessons, principal counselor lessons, and weeks and months that other schools celebrate as well. The re week of respect, school violence awareness week, red ribbon week, the great kindness challenge, and all kinds of service learning projects. <laughs> um, next slide. The brain-based science behind the research is rather compelling. The last part of the maturing brain to fully develop is the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive function center for impulse control, forethought, planning and the ability to anticipate consequences. That said, stands to reason that we need to teach our kids 
how to think about their behavior and create new neural pathways. In short, emotional regulation is not instinctive. It's learned. And this certainly applies to supporting kids and repairing relationships harmed by misconduct. Next slide, please. Um, in this slide, we're talking about resolving conflict and holding groups accountable, which is what Dr. Birdie had referred to um, in his opening. So in our school, we have um, reference posters in all the classrooms for the adults, for the teachers, um, the ed assistants to help them, um, you know, talk to kids, think of ways to help resolve these conflicts um, before they come to the office. Um, so those, those would be like tier one and two classroom managed behavior. So it could be things like not completing work or not following directions maybe just like minor conflicts between kids or using unkind words. Um, tiers two and three, that those can be um, helping the kids to take a break and find a new environment. So whether that is in a buddy classroom or sometimes they'll come down to the office to see John or me um, and they will complete a reflection sheet that you see up there. And what they're doing is they're going through the affective questions and thinking about um, the problem and really reflecting. And then they meet with an adult, whether it's their teacher or one of us, and we help them to like look at what skills they could use use in a situation like that and what would work better next time. So really, especially in the elementary school and as you move along as well, it's a learning experience for the kids um, because we want them to learn how to make better choices. And then um, there is a tier four uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping the restorative meeting. Sorry about that. Um, so once once the person who's done the harm um, reflects, we do have them come together if it's okay with the person who has been harmed. And we help that child to set some boundaries and to give I messages so that they can express how they're feeling and what they need, which is really important in like healing what has happened. And then tier four behaviors, which would be um, principal addressed by the principal, or it could be things that um, are code of conduct related or related to um, HIB incidents. So um, those would be both restorative and also traditional. Reframing our priorities uh, doesn't just better align with our vision and mission, it, it's required by state law. Uh, like many states, New Jersey caught on to the aforementioned trends, and back in 2018, the legislature enacted a law requiring uh, elementary schools to provide restorative discipline activities uh, when students are denied recess. At uh, Woodcrest, uh, as Kara referenced, the staff continually reflects on our students' behavioral needs uh, so that we can continue to refine our strategies. Consequently, uh, restorative practices are often referred to at Woodcrest as the glue that holds all of our initiatives together, uh, including our work in the areas of cultural proficiency, character education, and uh, No Place for Hate, just to name a few. Next slide, please. And I believe I'm to turn it over to, to Dr. Birdie. Thank you. I think it's going to Mrs. Sorry, I'm putting my back to you guys. I am Christina Hennis. Um, I am the interventionist at Carusi Middle School. This is actually my 19th year at Carusi. Um, I was the communications exploratory teacher for 17 years prior to becoming the interventionist. So while I am here, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Morton and Dr. Birdie for this amazing opportunity because I do honestly love what I'm doing and I'm super excited to share. Um, so I, I went a little different because I know we've, you know, Dr. Birdie and our friends at Woodcrest are giving you the background and things I'm sure you've already known about restorative practice. Um, so I figured I'd share some of what the kids see um, restorative practice as. So as on the slide, you know, we start in my classroom, um, I was given the opportunity to create a space. Um, the students helped me create a space um, where it's conducive to learning and not just education, you know, per se, like lessons and lesson plans, but learning for all students where they can all feel safe, they can learn from each other, um, conflict resolution. We like to call it a Mustang mentoring at Carusi. Um, and if you look here on the pictures, you can see we talked a little bit, Dr. Birdie mentioned relationships, building relationships, and that's not just student to student or student to teacher, but even teacher to teacher. Um, the picture in the middle there is our last in service. Um, Carusi does like a little tailgate beforehand and the teachers all come early. Um, and I have a big picture board behind my desk and the kids like to ask about the question, the pictures and bring pictures. And they always ask about that picture, even as new as the picture is, you know, what were you guys doing? you hang out like together in the morning? 
I'm like, yeah, like we get up early and we stand in the cold and we have coffee and we talk about you guys and what, you know, we get to know each other better. And that opens up a whole new perspective, even for the teachers to get to know the kids and reach out. My classrooms use not just for conflict resolution for the children. Um, sometimes they come to speak with me. Sometimes I have other teachers reach out. Hey, is your room free? Um, I want to meet with a student in a, in a open space, not my classroom per se, you know, give us both the opportunity to kind of meet and talk in like an open environment. Um, the kids, I often ask them, what is your, why, why do you like the program? Why do you want Mustang mentoring? Why are you here? And that's what the post-its are. Um, I don't want to read from the slide, but um, I did bring the post-its. The kids say things like it's a safe place. Um, one student wrote, my why is because now I look forward to getting up for school and my parents like it because I don't argue with them and I don't want to be late. So if you can get a kid to come to school just because they want to come to something you're doing, you know, for advisory, that's, you know, that's a win for me. Um, the kids talk about things like um, to do what you say and say what you mean. Um, they talk about things like, well, we're not always judged on our action, but maybe our intentions are different than our actions, but people are judging you on what they see you doing, maybe not what you meant. So how can we be clear on our intentions? Um, and if you switch the slide, please, I know this is, thank you. Um, you know, it's all warm and fuzzy and it feels good and it sounds good. Is it good? Where's the proof? Um, so just to add to some of the data that was already shared, um, we did some, some climate improvement and a little bit of um, questionnaire and data. And um, we, we found out that what the kids are doing, what we're doing, it is working. If you look at some of the statistics, um, even in the middle, I like to highlight where the orange is. If you look just even at 2001, um, 2021, 2022, September to November for Carusi, we had 347 administrative referrals that year, just September to November. So right around this time, um, in 22, 23, we were down to 162. And then this year alone, we're down to 75. Um, so to me, just in two short years, it's showing already that the kids are owning this and they're buying into it and the teachers are buying into it. Um, one other great um, thing I think we do before I turn it over to Ms. Giles is that there's a connection between everyone. Um, I often meet with Ms. Giles. I go up and visit former students. She starts to come down in January and start to meet the eighth graders so that when they come to the high school, they have a familiar face. Um, they know there's another space where they can take advantage of. Um, and we're just really trying to keep it pushing forward. So, all right, thank you. I'll turn it over to Ms. Giles. Good evening, everyone. I am Ashley Giles. I'm the student advocate at High School West, and thank you to Dr. Morton and Dr. Burns for this opportunity to speak with you tonight about restorative practice. High School West was the first school in the, in the district to have a fully, sane tra a fully trained staff in restorative practice. RP, as we call it, has become embedded in our school culture and is one of the guiding principles of the West Way. In homeroom and in class, teachers engage in, a res in restorative circles daily to build a foundation of community and learning environment. By taking a proactive approach to get students connected to their peers, to the staff, and to the school community, we are able to mitigate common behaviors and conduct incidents that typically occur within schools. Traditionally, when a code of conduct violation occurred, students were given an after school detention or a lunch detention or received um, in school or out of school suspension. Now with restorative practice in place, consequences for code of conduct violations still occur, but it is coupled with one, a restorative practice, a restorative conversation with any parties involved and two, an opportunity to repair any harm is presented. The restorative conversation is an integral part of the process. Students are given a chance to explain background information on, or their thought process, and a goal setting session occurs to help the student engage uh, or avoid engaging in the same behavior again, or to help make more productive decisions in the future. We value student voice, and we aim to get to the root cause of a student's behavior. The High School West Restorative Practice team is committed to involving and working with students in the process of repairing relationships after an offense has occurred. Relationship building and maintaining relationships is, is key to overall student success. High School West has ongoing partnerships with the Cherry Hill Police Department, with Project Little Warriors, where we have a yoga program, 
with Diva Richards, where we do mental and physical strength training, and they are all restorative practice programs. These community partners have programs focused on mentoring, mindfulness, de-escalation strategies, and health and wellness. Instead of traditional, and again, instead of traditional lunch attentions or consequences, students are engaged or encouraged to participate in a strategy that will provide space and opportunity for restorative conversations and relationship building. And as you can see on the slide, there's an example of one of our classes engaged in a circle that they do daily. If we can just go to the next slide, please. Just to pull a few data points, um, the, we looked at the first third of this school year versus the first third of the 2022-2023 school year. And as you can see, as of December 3rd, conduct incidents are trending downward, in some cases significantly trending downward. Um, when we look at student altercations, it's down 37%. And when we look at some of these data points, there are multi-layers of restorative practice systems that are in place to help these numbers trend downward. For example, with student altercations, we have conversations with our students, with our families, with our parents. We do mediations. So there's, there's lots of layers to this to make our, our numbers go down in this fashion. Um, cutting class or not attending class is down 34%. Um, being in an unauthorized area is down 84% or disruptive and inappropriate behavior is down 23%. Thank you for your time. I might have to take it even lower. <laughs> I'm Lauren Giordano. I'm the principal of the alternative campus. Um, and I just want to give lots of accolades to all my colleagues that went before a lot of the stuff at West I've seen in action and it's amazing to watch the peer leaders come in and train the freshmen, the seniors, just how to stand in a circle and communicate and talk about things that are important. So you guys are doing amazing things to you guys. Amazing to hear. Um, so I guess I would say our campus serves a wide aperture of children um, and we have to do things a little bit differently. As far as restorative culture, um, it's more than practice on our campus. It is our culture, it is our ethics, it's everything coming together in everything we do all day long. Um, I guess we operate under the guiding questions. You know, the most important thing is do we know a student? Do we have a relationship? Have we co created a space or a community within our, each individual classroom that has defined agreements that are based in mutual respect? All teachers start the year off through student voice and circles, designing what the norms in their classroom will be. The students choose the three topics. This year, it was respect, responsibility, and kindness. Then they define what does it look like, what does it sound like, and what does it feel like. Teachers post it on the wall. That way, our staff isn't going around managing behaviors. They're just maintaining the boundaries of their community that is their classroom. So when something happens and someone's out of alignment, we always value the human being first, right? We're more concerned with how can we help you heal? How can we help repair rather than how do you pay for your action? So we're just consistently maintaining those boundaries. And as the principal, I'm maintaining the boundaries of the whole community and what do we stand for and how do we treat the children that come into our building every day? Um, and also how do we work with families? Because a lot of times we're working with families that may have been, you know, a negative outlook on conduct on, they feel like their children haven't had a fair shot. Many different things walk in when the children walk in a lot of additional issues or things that need to be resolved. So working with parents, working with families, working with children and being authentic is the most proactive thing that we do. Next slide. Um, so, our system continues to evolve. Even this year, we've done a lot of work to meet and be relevant to the children that have come and started this year. Um, we train all teachers on de-escalation, all have a firm grounding in how to, how to be trauma-informed when they respond to children. Um, we have established a weekly PLC that meets and we are the restorative practice team. We meet, we talk about children, we plan lessons for our success center, which is something we introduced this year as well. In the success center, it runs four periods of the day. So rather than giving a child an in-school suspension or an out-of-school suspension 
or bringing them into the office to talk. There's a whole bunch of different people that might pull a child one period of a day and talk it out, do a reflection sheet, try to help the child take multiple perspectives. And then they might come back another period of the day where all we do is work on being invested in their growth. Therapists are involved in this as well. Doctor that's on campus is involved, our nurse. Um, we build respect agreements. We do reset plans also as a proactive measure. Every single child goes through an induction when they come onto our campus. This is where we meet with them through the Success Center. We help 100% of the children on our campus have an identified adult that they feel comfortable going to, speaking to, and that knows them, sees them, and makes them feel heard. That is all through the, the success center, the relationships built, and it's identified on a reset plan. A hundred percent of the children in our building can identify triggers. hundred percent of the children in our building can identify two places in our building they can go when they need to reset, right? So all these things are compiled and given out to staff so that they have a quick reference guide to help children when they're in crisis and help redirect and deescalate and value the human and separate the action or what is actually happening in time and space. Um, as far as connecting beyond the classroom, that's something we take very seriously. We do all kinds of things each month to celebrate children from three different categories in which we do recognize children to staff handwriting letters before the kids come on the campus for every student to writing them things over Thanksgiving and mailing them home why they're grateful for them to identifying them, their strengths and posting them all over the school, right? Those are just some of the bigger actions. Um, I could, I'd need all day to encompass all the things they do moment to moment to celebrate children. Um, Student-based field trips, they have a lot of voice in where we go, what we do and why we go. Um, we also use PBIS Rewards. It's an app that only the children choose what goes into it. They choose what they, they earn what goes into our school store um, and their parents get text messages all day long of about their good behavior. So it's a way for us to reconnect with families and really celebrate and highlight positive things all day long, especially for families that generally answer the phone, what did they do now? You know what I mean? It just kind of changes the whole dynamic of how a family views a child, how the school views a child and how this child views us as the educators. Next slide. Awesome. And these are just, this is just some of the stuff I talked about. That is our system, the success center structured day. Um, and I know that there has been a concern about consequences not existing in partnership with restorative practice. So a perfect example of that. And like my colleagues said, we're always working with children. So in lieu of an in-school suspension, child might have a structured day. That's where they go to all their academic classes, only the other periods of the day, we're working on accountability, we're working on growth, we're working on reflection. Sometimes we're even doing an accountability project where they're researching different things in history, time and space that relate to the actions and the impact. Um, we have a grid that if you wanted to click on in your own time, you can, that just shows how we do that. And anytime a student is suspended or excluded from the school community, they return on a structured day. And exclusion really is used in partnership with families to give us some time to plan a better way to reintroduce them. And then the whole day when they return is focused around them, reintroducing them, supporting them, understanding, listening to them and giving them the opportunity to build the capacity to maybe have a conversation with someone or to maybe put something down that's really heavy. Um, so again, even if you were excluded from our campus, we're still working with you and your family while you're not there because we're working on how we can reintroduce and build that day for you when you return. So as my colleague said, you know, the main premise of it is that we're never going to punish anybody. We can't punish trauma out of kids. We can't get results from doing that. We really need to focus on how do we heal and how do we understand rather than how do they pay for their actions. Um, and that is really what the basis of it is. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. We appreciate the time. I guess at this point, we would open it up for questions for myself or any of my colleagues. Sure. 
And do any board members have any questions? Mrs. Winters. Thank you. I just want to pick up on something that Ms. Giordano said about, you know, giving positive feedback to parents, because in my former career, I was a youth minister for a decade. And that was something that I found to be very powerful with kids that were struggling, who were used to having an adult call the house. And instead of telling them what their kid was doing right, telling them what their kid was doing wrong, or they assumed that when I called, it was, what did he do now? What did she do now? Um, so I just really want to you know, emphasize that to have those relationships with families where you do catch a kid do something good and you do provide that feedback that builds that bridge so that when you're moving forward together as a team, you have that connection. So I just want to really praise Mr. O'Donnell for that work. My, um, my question, my concern is this, as most of you know, I have three children in the district. We've been in multiple schools. I love restorative practices. I find that it's being implemented very unevenly in the district. And I think that, you know, the staff members who came here tonight to talk with us are probably some of our strong implementers. But what I would like to know is some of our schools seem to be struggling on some of these issues, on bringing kids together, on resolving conflict, on helping us have those hard conversations. How will implementation be done more evenly across the district so that all of our students can benefit from restorative practice? I'm going to I'm going to let Dr. Morton answer the the main part of that. But let me start with a little um, uh, a quick response, uh, which is for the first time uh, in the 22 years that I've been here in Cherry Hill, uh, restorative practice training is mandatory as part of our flex option this year for all uh, for all staff. Uh, so so for the first time, we're, we're really looking at, again, a, a common language, a common lens, a common way to not only understand what is restorative practice or, or what are restorative practices, uh, but really how do we in some way consistently and evenly uh, implement them, not only at all schools, but at all levels. Uh, so for the first time, again, in, 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 that I'm aware of, uh, that will be mandatory for all uh, faculty members uh, this school year. Dr. Morton, I don't know if I don't want to take, take your answer, but I'm not sure if you're- well, You, you stole my thunder a bit, but, but that, that was the perfect response. Um, I, can I can tell you this. So- um, Back in the 2016 school year, I had come to Dr. Malash with the idea that I wanted to move High School West into becoming a restorative practices building. Uh, he had me present to the to the CNI committee, I believe, back all the way back 2016. Uh, and the next year, 17, 18, we trained the entire High School West staff, uh, the entire the entire staff. Um, part of the planning, budget planning, was to put funds to, aside to ensure that that training could take place. Uh, the critical piece is that people need common definitions, common understanding, and that training provides just that. Uh, there's a training on what we learned, so, some of the things that we learned today about what restorative practices is and what it isn't. And additionally, the whole uh, method of utilizing circles as well, two full days, uh, all encompassing. So, you know, we're looking forward to the training across the board to provide some greater consistency um, and, you know, know-how and, and strategies, we, we think we'll be able to pick up steam uh, in terms of the consistency across the board, you know, after this year through, the, through that training. I appreciate that. And I remember the flex option conversation that we had in CNI just a few months ago. I guess my concern is that, you know, you started this at West, my understanding is back in 2016. West seems to be very far along in this process and it shows. And it shows in the evidence you presented tonight about how when used correctly, you decrease a lot of these behaviors that, you know, we don't want to see among our students and you increase empathy, understanding and community building, which is something I think we really desperately need in a lot of our schools in our district right now. Um, and it really, I'm excited for the flex options. I'm excited for the training, I guess, you know, I, as we talk about all of our schools and looking at their individual cultures and climates and what we need to really think about moving forward, I just hope that we can increase that consistency and that support for our staff, um, to have that training and that buy-in so this can be done effectively and we can grow it throughout our district so we can see those positive impacts for all of our kids. Yeah, just one other thing that I'll mention as well. Uh, one of the things that we have done is that we work with um, IARP uh, to identify staff members to serve as trainers themselves. So they've gone through uh, the training program and they become trainers. I believe they've they've come out and done some work over at uh, Carusi Middle School and some other schools also. So we have uh, more than a dozen staff members here in district trained as RP trainers. Um, so, you know, we have to start someplace. 
So, but you're hearing from- I know, I'm ambitious. I always want them to go faster, go faster. Yes, yes, yes you are. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, um, you know, from what we heard tonight, you know, there's, there's a good frame and a good desire to, uh, to move forward with this, with this model. We know it works. No, I appreciate that. And just so to be clear, my commentary comes from having had kids who have gone to phenomenal, phenomenal schools where this is being implemented. All our schools are phenomenal. But the schools that my kids have attended where it's worked really well, I have seen the difference that it makes in those school communities. And it's not just about, as one of the presenters said, it's not just about reacting when an incident happens. It's about building a climate together where we have those things in place to create a positive culture where our students feel safe and can talk to each other and resolve conflict productively and create empathy and understanding. And if we're really looking to grow young people who are able to operate with those skill sets in the world, which are so, so needed now more than ever, I really think this is something we need to be aggressive on. And I know Dr. Morton, I'm always saying more, faster, quicker, how can we help? But I, I just, the feedback we've gotten at the board level these last couple of months has really just shown me the importance of training like this and programs like this for all of our kids. And I really, I take it seriously that all 11,000 of them are our responsibility. So I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. I really, truly do. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of the positive impacts you're having for our schools. This is Elmer Stratton. I was just going to add for Ms. Winters and probably you probably guess what I'm going to say, uh, but this work um, it really lends to the the necessary the necessity for the labor management collaborative as well, because um, that team uh, the steering committee for that team is really um, ensuring that the messages are the same going out to the staff teams that the the wording being used is is the same and consistent going out to staff teams. Um, and I think if that continues, that will make see some of the 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 impact that you're saying. Maybe it's not just in one building, but it'll start to streamline. It's going to take a little bit of time, of course. You know, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it it is happening. So, uh, you know, kudos to Dr. Birdie and the the LMC steering committee. They're really um, sticking to this. Thank you, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. And, and I think I think it's important to 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 just reinforce how lockstep the two things are. I mean, they're they're working uh, harmoniously as we as we move th uh, through through both of these uh, initiatives concurrently. Um, to Mrs. Winter's point, we we don't have time, right, to 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 sit and watch or, or admire a problem. Uh, so so uh, this fall, all 19 schools surveyed students, uh, families, and staff. Uh, to take a look at those key indicators of culture and climate uh, and, and everything from belongingness, you know, the very bottom of the Maslow Psych 101 uh, needs chart, all the way through physical safety, uh, through uh, through interpersonal relationships, through relationships between children, relationships between staff and children, uh, and really to, to baseline, uh, you know, those data and look for trends and patterns so all 19 schools can create actionable goals and timelines. Uh, so, so the work is happening. It's happening concurrently, um, and and it's happening um, in in a really uh, coordinated way. I think the effort um, has been super positive so far, and I, I only imagine it will get better the deeper we get into it. So, one more point. Go. Will you indulge me one more question, Mr. Mayor? Please. Yes, of course. He's such a softy. <laughs> um, I just want to comment that the, the school climate survey that was done, I was super invested in it. Um, I actually took a workshop class on it down at the board workshop in Atlantic City. Um, but again, just to and not to, you know, repeat myself, but the implementation of that climate survey, Dr. Morton can tell you, I had a lot of thoughts about how it was differently implemented among our different schools. Um, certain schools, like the middle school that one of my kids attends, reminded me every week, several times a week to complete the climate survey. And so, so I did, because, you know, as parents, especially if you have kids in multiple schools, you're getting about 10 million emails a day about things you should be doing, places you should be going, things you should be clicking on. And we only remember half of them. Um, so my experience for two of my children where the principals um, and the admin in those schools were highly invested in getting responses was very different than other schools where um, it was not the case that I felt like parents were repeatedly asked in the midst of their busy lives to engage with this tool, which I think is critical for understanding the baseline of where we are with culture and climate. So again, I think it's a consistency issue. And I'd just like to see 
if this is the direction we're going, and I think it's the right direction, and we see the assets and the benefits in some of our schools that are highly invested, motivated to do this and doing it well, I just, I worry that some of the schools that are struggling the hardest with this are also the schools who maybe didn't aggressively pursue getting parent input in that climate survey, um, aren't pursuing this at that, at that level. So we almost need to flip the script where you guys are the models and we appreciate you, but you're, it's like preaching to the choir. We know, we know certain schools are, you know, reminding parents who are harried and running here, there and everywhere 500 times to go replete, uh, go do the climate survey. We need to make sure that every family has those opportunities and every student um, to be part of this culture and climate change where we're investing in here in Cherry Hill. I think without calling out any schools as well, I, that is going to be super important, but I, not but. In addition to that, I think we have to also model that you know, whenever we have the opportunity as well, you know, we are, we are a product of, uh, you know, attitude is reflected in leadership. So if we're not walking that walk at this level, then it's never going to trickle down to everyone. So it's going to take not just conversations at the administrative level, it's going to take conversations at the caregiver level, at the ed assistant, the facilities, it's going to take all of us and the impact will be great. And we just have to uh, commit to the process and understand that there's a greater good for it. So. Dr. Root. So first off, I just want to say thank you to everybody for your, for your efforts. Um, and for uh, the way you presented it, it's not just, you know, here's restorative practices and we're doing it. It was a really nice to see some actual data that this is not only something that's going to benefit, that we know will benefit our kids from a very like, you know, emotional or theoretical or, you know, psychological perspective, but there's a data driven like need for these type of types of practices to reduce um to reduce a uh, uh, problem behavior and to really improve student interactions and student teacher interactions. Um, so I guess um, my, my question is um, as, as for the two years that I've been on the board, one of the places of toxicity that I've seen um, surrounding code of conduct and student behavior really comes from parents. It's the, well, I didn't, that child wasn't even punished. And I just shout out to Ms. Giordano, the you can't punish the trauma out of a child is like, I'm going to remember that. That's one of the best like phrases I've heard in a long time. That's so really resonates. Um, but I've seen parents, you know, you know, call for, you know, devastating consequences. They're not happy with what they've seen. In the restorative practices, is there a literature or research or any kind of, uh, you know, functional within the district mechanism for as things come up um, uh, for teaching parents about how their restorative practices are being used with their children and how things, you know, how, how the, you know, I know that the, there is, you have to have some privacy around disciplinary issues, but is there an education component for parents that there's a growing understanding outside of just the children and the teachers in the school. So I'll, I'll just allude to one more thing that Ms. Mr. Saparito said that in some, some things like safety, and I think restorative justice is another area, it takes the whole community to kind of be involved, so. Yeah, there, there definitely is um, uh, an, an awareness and informational piece, I think, you know, with parents in the community, uh, the efforts in terms of repairing harm and helping to, um, you know, restore relationship focuses primarily with the students who have to interact with one another and coexist peacefully within the school building. But I think uh, the restorative strategies extend to, you know, how we relate to, to parents and, you know, trying to gain an understanding of, you know, how people present. Uh, I'm typically very, very calm with the exception of when it comes to my children. So when it comes to my children, this all changes, <laughs> you know? So there's an emotionality that we all have um, as it relates to, you know, the, those that are, that are nearest and, and dear to us. Um, but, but yes, parents and, and, you know, the greater community need to be aware of uh, what is happening. Um, and, and just, if I can just add some, some substance to 
what what it is that we're trying to do. Just to reiterate uh, Dr. Birdie's point, you know, we believe in in, in systems change. It's, it's not about initiatives here and here and there. Just things, you know, all in the air. Like you know, we're juggling a bunch of things. Uh, we believe in trying to have a coordinated way of moving forward, where each component of the system is working together to to move us uh, to move us forward. Um, yes, th there there were some schools that that jumped to the survey process that we, we took part in. Uh, there was others that, that needed some encouragement, but by the end of the day, you know, we had nearly 4,000 students participate in the survey. We had um, about 800 staff members participate and nearly 2,000 parents um, participate in the survey. And we only um, surveyed grade five in the elementary schools uh, just because of, you know, age and, and, and experience. Um, so yes, I think, you know, as we continue to move forward in this systematic way uh, and we build steam and build momentum, um, I like to say like one first down at a time, eventually we'll get to the end zone and score a touchdown. That was for my uh, former football player, Dr. Birdie. I, I was I was thinking, Dr. Morton, when you when you were, you know, when you were talking, you know, I, I can't speak to which school sent reminders or who sent memos or who put it in their weekly s'more. Uh, but what I have seen is, uh, you know, uh, the focus that, uh, and again, uh, you know, it's, it's indicative of leadership. Dr. Morton uh, has has uh, has revamped the entire district leader team, uh, district leadership team process to bring representation from every school together uh, four times a year, uh, with the with the sole purpose of looking at culture and climate uh, at each of the schools. So I'm not sure what happened prior to the data collection, but I can tell you that uh, since the data collection, there's been a ton of great work done by every school. Uh, not just uh, as a district leadership team, but also in their individual buildings, uh, taking a hard look at their data, uh, trying to identify patterns and really figuring out where to dig in uh, and improving their own building culture. So, um, you know, the, the uh, Dr. Morton and Mr. Redfern have visited uh, uh, probably half at this point of the uh, school climate teams in the district. Uh, they're slated to visit the other half in January. Um, and again, what, what's getting monitored, monitored is getting done around here. And, um, and that starts with leadership. So uh, I think uh, whether they were quick to put the survey out or needed some encouragement, um, you know, more importantly, the, the baseline work is done and, um, and we've been able to, to really start to get to the, the actual work, which is improving school climate. I was just going to add, Dr. Rude, this might also be something with they, since they have the cool infographic, maybe it's possible that that could also be placed on the website or um, especially when we get to the point where we have that dashboard that we've been talking about and looking forward to. I'll just um, we'll conclude this. First of all, Dr. Morton, that was risky. I'm mentioning first downs one at a time. In this environment, after last night's <laughs> local team had some, had some oh, even riskier to admit that in public. It's being recorded and streamed. Right. Um, and um, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, um, you 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 began your comments by saying that we could probably predict what you were going to say, and and I'll just simply say every time that green light goes on in front of your microphone, we can never predict exactly what you're going to say, and I'm going to really miss that. Um, but getting back to um, getting back to you know the presentation. Thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, the data alone um, does does what you know other board members have pointed out. It helps us know understand. So you can show us, you can show everyone what we what we understand um, that it works, and that there is more to restorative practices than just words. It's not just uh, it's not just happy talk. It's not just something that's done to make um, kids feel better. It is a tremendously important element of um, improving the, the climate in the schools. Um, it is a component and a partner to accountability. Um, and most importantly, um, it, it is a tremendously important element of helping um, uh, you know, those who are involved, unfortunately, in instance, they shouldn't be involved in understand more about what happened, the decisions that maybe led them to make a bad choice um, and to, to move on from there. One of the foundational principles that you mentioned, um, belonging in community um, is, is, is couldn't be more important. It's always important. It couldn't be more important now, um, not just in our schools, but outside of our schools, in our homes. Um, 
uh, you know, every, everywhere. And so the fact that the, the programs are beginning to build that much more steam and show real um, effectiveness um, couldn't be better timed. Um, I've said this before that you know if if we if we settle um, for success, then um, you know th that's a bit of a loss, right? So we can't settle for success. We need to keep moving forward, and I'm glad to see it's working at all the levels. And thank you, that's extra work, right? That you're all doing, but it's a work that you believe in, and it it makes the environment in the schools that much better. Makes it easier for our students to learn, to improve, to achieve. Um, and, and move on with their lives and whatever that, uh, whatever that might be. So um, all of you that came here tonight, thank you. Dr. Birdie, you've been here for two things. Is there a third we're not, you know, we're gonna wait for or you, you're good? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <laughs> well, have a seat in the back. Just me saying thank we'll you be... and reminding everybody it is a school night and I know teachers, uh, you know, they go to bed about 8.30, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, for all of you for coming out for the presentation. Thank you Wonderful. guys, we appreciate it. We have no administrative reports this evening, so we will move on to board member correspondence. Do any board members have any correspondence they would like to share this evening? Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Just one, uh, The again, just the LMC met again and they're continuing their work. Uh, they are, it's really taking, um, taking serious the collective nature of the work and what is happening with climate and culture. And so they had a, their most recent re meeting this past week. And so just want to put that out there. Mrs. Winters. I had the privilege of attending two events in the district. I got to be at Rosa for the Meet the Author event, which was phenomenal. Um, the author who came to Rosa did a presentation about her new book that the kids were super engaged in. And she talked about the freedom to read, who, if any of you know what a reader I am and how that's pretty much how I escape my life all the time, it's close, near and dear to my heart. Um, so it was talking about the freedom to read and the importance of them using their voices to speak out and advocate um, for what they feel is important. When I got there, the author was sitting in the library and there was a line of students super excited to meet her and have her sign a bookmark. And she was patient and kind with all of the students, encouraging thoughtful responses to their comments and really took some time to engage with them during the day. So a really successful event at Rosa. And I was pleased to be there to speak with her a little bit afterwards and be part of it. I also was privileged to attend a Midsummer Night's Dream at East on Saturday night. As Dr. Rude knows, he and I are buddies and our love of Shakespeare binds us together as board members. It's his favorite thing ever to think about. No, um, I did drag my son and my nephew with me. By drag, I mean greatly encourage them. And they were shocked to find out how much they actually liked it. Um, I really thought I'd have to bribe them with mountains of snacks at intermission because they went in a little bit nervous. They wouldn't understand what was going on. But actually, once they saw the phenomenal performance at East and recognized a bunch of their classmates doing such great work up on the stage, they really enjoyed it. Um, either that or they were just telling me that to my face. But I'd like to think that, you know, the kids who were there and saw the performance really appreciated the hard work that their fellow students did and got a better appreci appreciation and understanding. I think for a lot of people, Shakespeare can be intimidating, but I thought the students really pulled it off um, and did a great job and everybody had a wonderful night. Any other board members? Correspondence. Seeing none, we will move on to our student representatives reports. Um, I was gonna suggest some sort of feat of strength between yourself and Colin, see who's gonna go first tonight. But since Colin had to leave a little bit earlier, I understand that he left his comments for you. So Matt, you can decide whether Cherry Hill East or Cherry Hill West report is gonna go first. A lot of pressure, but I'll, I'll go with East. Um... So to start, we have the interim report cards coming out on Friday, December 22nd at 4 p.m. And uh, next week we have winter break with no school for the whole of next week and a return to school on Tuesday, January 2nd. So hopefully those report cards are good. Otherwise, you have a lot of time with your uh, parents to do some, to do some explaining. <laughs> uh, for both high school East and West, there will be an early dismissal on the fourth Friday of each month beginning in January. 
and this will be a way to give students uh, time to rest and teachers extra preparation time. On January 5th, there will be a meeting for all club leaders with Mr. Davis. And as we return from break, though, there will be eighth grade transition process starting for high school. Um, this includes uh, course selection, school introductions. A lot of those processes really says uh, how fast we've been moving through this year. Um, this period of December has been a really big period for seniors committing to college. And this can be tracked through the uh, Instagram account CHE24 commits. And then Eastside's December issue was released last week. The freshman dance will be held on the 19th of January. The FOP holiday party was held recently with many students in attendance. The English Honor Society inductions were last Wednesday. And there was recently a Habitat for Humanity Build Day where students uh, had day of service to help build homes for uh, local communities. And then in the Performing Arts sec uh, Center, uh, we have uh, vocal groups perform at the White House this past weekend. Um, really an unforgettable experience for them, a great experience to go down to the Capitol and perform at one of our nation's most famous buildings. Um, as Ms. Winters described, we had the uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream uh, fall play concluded this past weekend. And the spring musical Mean Girls tryouts have begun just now, really quick turnaround. Um, and then there will be a winter choral concert on January 18th. And this Thursday, December 21st, there will be an instrumental concert. In terms of competitions, the chess team has continued to do well recently. And uh, winter sports teams have uh, started out into the beginning of their seasons. Girls wrestling team had a great showing this past weekend with a competitor in the top three of the Queen of the East competition. Uh, continuing East's strong girls wrestling team performances. Uh, there's a recent robotics tournament, continued success, and um, we'll be happy to see that can, their continued th success throughout the season. Uh, DECA regionals will take place on the 9th of January. Two teams from History Club qualified for the National History Quiz Bowl competition, and East Model UN attended the TechMun conference at Camden County Technical School on December 9th. For culture clubs, German Club traveled to Philadelphia past Friday, and African American Culture Club will hold a Unity Day on January 12th, the uh, day before the Martin Luther King Day holiday weekend. And that's it for East. All right, moving into uh, West. Hopefully you're not too tired of my voice yet. Um, for academics, guidance had instant decision days for Montclair State University, Monmouth, Ryder, Temple, and Stockton. There's a financial aid info night for students and parents on January 9th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. For the arts, on December 13th, West's photography classes toured Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia to learn about the prison's history and to collect inspiration for future projects. Earlier today, West Catering served grilled cheese, soup, and assorted cookies for West Faculty Book Club Luncheon. On December 13th, West had its winter vocal concert with performances from West Singers, Men of Note, Ramada, Vocal Workshop, and many other choir students. Alumni, alumni came on stage to perform the last two songs of the competition. The instrumental concert was held late last week with the uh, wind, wind Ensemble, Orchestra, Lab Band, and Jazz Band all performing. And the A Christmas Story musical was successful with great crowds every night. The musical was performed on Friday, December 1st, for the elementary and middle school students. For athletics, unified bowling has begun. The Positive Coaching Alliance workshop with East and West students gathered at West to hear from Randy Nathan and talk about competing with empathy. There's a uh, girls, girls and boys swimming win against Morristown Friends on December 11th with the girls winning 106 to 60 and the boys winning 61 to 21 and another win against Haddon Township with the girls winning 84 to 63 and the boys winning 85 to 61. There's a girls bowling win against Lenape on December 7th and Seneca on December 12th. And a girls and boys basketball, basketball win against Camden Catholic on December 14th with the girls winning 38 to 12 and the boys 52 to 44. For extracurriculars, West Model UN also attended the Tech Model UN conference at Camden County Technical School on December 9th. The Lions Roar newspaper is up and running, and the first pr print issue came out last week. For other notes, from December 11th to 15th, West students volunteered to prepare for the first FOP party since the pandemic, and over 100 students from West and East attended. Um, 600 students with, with special needs from across Burlington and Camden counties attended to celebrate the holidays and were visited by Santa and Mrs. Claus. 
And uh, now students are looking forward to the break and the start of 2020, uh, 2024. Yeah. Hopefully not looking forward to the break too much. Um, Matt, thank you. And thank you for um, pinch hitting for, um, for Colin and for Jerry Hill West. So we are now up to our first public comment. There will be two public comments this evening. No, have a seat, just a second. I'm, 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 I'm glad you're excited about this, right? That means we're doing something right, or maybe you wanna say we're not, that's okay. Um, there will be two, two public comments this evening. The first public comment is for agenda items only. So um, when you take the mic, um, we'll ask you not only to state your name and your town of residence, not your actual address, um, but also the agenda item um, that you are speaking on. You are welcome to remain for a second public comment. If your comment is not about an agenda item, that would be appropriate for second public comment. And we'll talk about that uh, a little later when we get through the rest of our agenda. Um, if there are students in the room, I don't know if there are, or if there are students online, students online, put an S next to your name so we know that you will be at the uh, beginning of both first and second public comment. But if there are any students, you can speak on any issue during first public comment. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of the Cherry Hill School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, this being a limited public forum, statements which demean individual community members or groups, or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or repetitious will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent board president and all board members via email or other alternative means. Are there any students in the room that would wish to come to the podium? Seeing none, I'll go online and see if there are any students online. Seeing, I don't believe I'm seeing any students online. All right, seeing no students online, we'll go back to the room. Any public comment on agenda items, if you would state your name and town of residence. Sure, Dr. Yoni Yaris, Cherry Hill, starting off at 15.1. I uh, want to acknowledge that Julie Farkas has put in for her retirement. She is one of the last eight or nine remaining who opened Rosa 25-ish years ago. Um, her smile lights up that halls. Um, it's really hard to think of her. I didn't have her as a teacher, but you felt like every student had her with the way how warmly she greeted every student she came across with. It's also the Rosa love story with her and Mr. Farkas, um, which is always a good Rosa memory of them uh, becoming a pair and just being a dynamic duo of people just there for students. Um, I wish her well and all of that. It also raises a concern. I think she is the third or fourth foreign language teacher at the middle school level to have retired in recent months, um, and it seems to have been after the restructuring of the middle school schedule where when I was a student in the district all those many years ago, um, foreign language was on team or on house or on learning community, depending on which middle school you went to and what language you used. But then as we put more focus on math, very important, and move that back to being on house, on team, or LLC, foreign language then got moved to more of the elective schedule that math was on. This has now caused massive enrollment um, as you're trying to juggle all of these different things and the rigidity of the middle school schedule. So I think going forward as a board plans ahead with budget season and looking at strategic vision is what is the best way to go about foreign language instruction at the middle school level with the growing decrease of our staff. And there seems to be no talent pool to pull from. So do we look at bringing in new languages potentially that have a higher pool or things like that? Is it a chance for Cherry Hill to innovate and do what we do great, which is think creatively in terms of problems. I also want to move to when students leave the district, I um, just want to acknowledge the effort that Dr. Morton and his team made um, and the superintendency in terms of adjusting graduation from being off job vote and moving it um, to a date that was not a Jewish holiday. I sincerely appreciate it. I know we have, my family and I brought it up to Dr. Malash. Things happened. Dr. Morton hopped right on it when he transitioned into his role. Um, I just really wanted to show and express great appreciation uh, for being mindful of that and that both times 
will allow people to get home for the Sabbath and all of that. And just really great appreciation. And that is what our community does. So thank you. We'll go to the line and Laura Ann's iPad. <clears throat> Ann Einhorn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Item 14.3, the report of assets and resources from the general fund ending October the 31st, 2023. The capital reserve account is listed at 13248337 um, Can someone please tell me at what amount is currently in the capital reserve account? Item 15.3, there are two ed assistants transitioning into um, teaching positions. I assume that they're already fully certified teachers. It's really not clear to me with the way that it's documented. Item 15.4, the community uh, parent involvement specialist. Is that a new position? Um, quite frankly, I didn't look up what it entails, but is that position funded by our district or is it part of the state uh, funding source that we received earlier in the year? 15.5, two Kingston elementary teachers have been out on leave. Do we have teachers in place to fulfill those vacancies. 15.9, 15 positions at Cherry Hill West, uh, teaching additional classes. Um, of, of those positions that are listed, eight of those classes are, are teachers are for special education. Does our Board of Ed have any concerns in that how many classes we keep assigning as extra classes, though they're paid for it? and the delivery of instruction. I'm really worried about burnout in this district. And then item 16.3 really concerns me um, in that you're voting on the board secretary to advertise an appropriate notice of the vacant board seat. Mrs. Fleischer gave her resignation on December the 5th. It was last Wednesday an innocuous post was made in the Courier Post as required by law, but I don't know who saw it. And it wasn't until I believe last Friday that was anything was on the district website. So quite frankly, I'm insulted by that. You know that it's a strenuous time for this school, for this community, um, the holidays notwithstanding. And I find it an insult that you're giving people exactly five business days to uh, apply for a very important position. This could have been done on December the 6th, but it was not. Thank you. Go back to the room. Any other comments on agenda items specifically? Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill, 14.5. Uh, I want to thank the board for listening to the public when they said um, to award transportation bids, um, not just based on the lowest, but on the lowest, most responsive and responsible bidder. Um, I know that you're supposed to take the lowest bid. Thank you for um, keeping my taxes as low as possible, but thank you for also keeping the safety of the students and taking not necessarily the lowest bid, but the most responsible uh, company that applies. See no hands online. We will stay in the room. Name and town. Rick Short, Cherry Hill, 16.3. Uh, uh, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Ms. Fleischer for uh, the four sets of uh, meetings that uh, went through. Uh, at the four sets of meetings, it was all they were they were talking about um, the east transfers of uh, of uh, teachers. Um, doesn't seem that the uh, board was listening or that the district was listening. I want to thank her also for not believing the words that um, our previous superintendent said. He said, um, basically, he said this. Um, uh, this is the uh, best for the district. I can't really, I can't really speak of uh, employment policies, but this is the best for the district. And Ms. Fleischer stood up for uh, um, 
one of the uh, transfers from East. Everyone was calling up for him. Um, she was the one of the uh, two people uh, that voted no on the transfers because she put students first. Um, and that poor that poor teacher right now is uh, in Carusi. Um, you know, had 17 years as the best AP teacher, but our district uh, felt that uh, he was better served to be a regular social studies teacher in Carusi. Thank you, Ms. Fleischer. Thank you. Uh, no other hands online. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to speak to an agenda item? Seeing none, we'll close first public comment and move on to our acting superintendent's comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I'd like to uh, congratulate the Beck girls soccer team and Carusi field hockey team. It's outstanding to have an, a chance to recognize our students for their wonderful exploits. Uh, thank you to the staff members who presented on restorative practices and the strategies that are being utilized as well. Uh, we definitely feel that we are gaining momentum with that and look forward to all the wonderful possibilities that exist from there. Uh, just, to, just to give a note about uh, teacher professional learning community time, I uh, first and foremost like to thank the board for their support on that time. Um, over the last few days, uh, Mr. Redfern and I have had an opportunity to visit uh, multiple schools, uh, high schools west and east included, uh, where we met with the uh, labor management collaborative teams. And I can tell you that there was a tremendous amount of appreciation and gratitude uh, amongst the, the teachers and faculty there. Uh, high school is the only, only um, level that does not have PLC or professional learning uh, community time built into the structure of their schedule. And what that time does is it allows teachers to engage in common planning, common planning time. They can develop like common assessments. These are some of the things that were discussed today. Uh, analyze student data. Uh, there was talk about uh, setting up cross district meetings for articulation and collaboration, you know, the, the electives. Uh, so just very important. And I think uh, there's, there's great energy about how that time is gonna be utilized to, to best support our student needs and student learning. Uh, I also had an opportunity to attend uh, mid uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream. Kids were outstanding. I, I just never really can, can grasp how well the kids are able to, uh, you know, fulfill their parts and, and act, uh, you know, in front of in front of an audience. I think I'd freeze if, if I got up there. <laughs> uh, but also, um, like to recognize the students from High School West did a Christmas Story the musical as well. It was truly fantastic and included uh, students from across the district also. So, uh, absolutely a great job. Uh, the FOP party returned with a bang. The FOP uh, party had taken a hiatus following the uh, COVID you know, pandemic lockdown, but it was wonderful to, to get over and see the kids having a wonderful time and a festive atmosphere. Uh, that's what it's all about for us. Uh, I didn't have a chance during our last meeting to thank uh, Ms. Wilson, Barb Wilson, for putting together the We Care podcast. Our first episode launched last month. Uh, where I had an opportunity to, to speak with several students from high school East and high school West uh, who participate in the peer leaders program. So if you are driving or if you have some extra time, I, I, I ask that you take a listen to that. You get to hear from the students and, and learn about what their experience has been um, as they um, you know, have transitioned into, into our building. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. We will move on as soon as my computer decides to cooperate. Um, thank you, Dr. Morton. Uh, we'll now move on to our action agenda. We will start with curriculum and instruction. Mrs. Winters, would you please move that agenda? Certainly. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. 13.1, approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 23-24 school year. 13.2, approval of out-of-district student placement for 23-24 school year. 13.3, resolution authorizing acceptance of the New Jersey Learning Acceleration Program High Impact Tutoring Grants. And 13.4, approval of professional service agreements for the 23-24 school year. Do I have a second? Ms. Elmore Stratton, are there any questions? 
seeing none, I will just make a comment for those playing along at home. The high impact tutoring grant is something that my buddies on CNI and I aggressively discussed, pursued, probably people got sick of hearing us talk about it. Um, I want to thank Ms. Elmore Stratton, Dr. Rude, and Ms. Stern, who's not here tonight, for listening to me talk about it incessantly since January. Um, and I'm glad we finally manifested this into something that I think is really going to benefit our students this year as we continue to try to catch up from the pandemic school closures. So thank you. Ms. Sugars, can you please open the voting on the CNI agenda? Okay, board members, you may cast your votes. motion carries move on to business and facilities mr greenbaum would you please move that agenda thank you the superintendent recommends and i move the following 14.1 approval of minutes board working session special action meeting minutes and executive session minutes dated november 14th 2023 14.2, approval of minutes from regular meeting minutes and executive session minutes dated November 28th, 2023. 14.3, financial reports. 14.4, resolutions. 14.5, resolution for the award of bids. 14.6, resolution for the award of RFPs. 14.7, resolution for the award of transportation. 14.8, approval of license agreement for the Leocora Center for Graduation High School East. June 14th, 2024, 14.9, approval of license agreement for the Leo Cora Center, graduation of high school West on June 24th, 2024, 14.10, acceptance of donations. Do we have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, do I have a second? Mr. Mayor, any questions? Yes, Ms. Winters. I just want to take an opportunity under 14.7 to thank Ms. Sugars, Ms. King, and the rest of the transportation department for all the work that they did very, very quickly on the preschool expansion buses. I know it was a lot of work. It was a short amount of time. It was a big ask, and I really appreciate all you did to get this done so our preschoolers can start. So thank you. So Mrs. Winters, I just want to point out that these are quotes. <clears throat> we still need to go through a bid process, <clears throat> which we will start on in January. You're the best. Have I told you that? <laughs> it all goes to Mrs. King. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, please open the voting. Board members, you may cast your votes. And Mrs. Sugars, I need to abstain from 14.3 bill list five. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from 14.1. And Ms. Winters, I hit yes, but I need to abstain from 14.1. Okay, motion carries. All right, we're going to move on now to human resources. Mrs. Elmore Stratton for the final time. Would you please move that agenda? Absolutely. Uh, without the cheat sheets, this is horrible. Ms. Fletcher. Okay. <laughs> um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following 15.1 termination of employment certificate, 15.2 termination of employment non certificate, 15.3 appointment certificate, 15.4 appointments non certificate, 15.5 leave of absence certificate 15.6 leave of absence non certificated 15.7 assignment salary change certificate 15.8 assignment salary change non certificated and 15.9 other compensation certificated do i have a second mr rude are there any questions seeing none Ms. Sugars. board members you may cast your votes The motion carries. And we're going to move on to policy and legislation in Mrs. Fleischer's absence, which we have to get used to. I will move that agenda. 
Um, superintendent recommends that I move the following. Item 16.1, approval of harassment, intimidation, and bullying investigation decisions. Item 16.2, second reading of policies, specifically policy 2270, religion in schools, policy 3324, right of privacy, policy 4324, right of privacy and policy 5116, education for homeless students and youth. Item 16.3, acceptance of board member resignation. And 16.4, consent to approve 16.1 through 16.3. Do I have a second? Mr. Greenbaum, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, would you open the voting? Board members, you may cast your votes. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from 16.1, please. Ms. Sugars, I also have to abstain from 16.1, and I don't see it a, an option for I guess so on 16.3. <laughs> okay, motion carries. Strategic planning is up next. There are no items to address or vote on this meeting. So we move on to new business. Do any board members have new business to bring up this evening? One item of new business um, is the open uh, board vacancy. Um, as uh, published and as alluded to earlier in the meeting, um, the Cherry Hill Board of Education has an open vacancy. We are seeking candidates to fill that position. So anyone uh, in the room, anyone online, um, for those who are interested, the most important um, and really the only date that matters right now is December 22nd. That is the date by which a letter of intent um, needs to be sent um, and that can be sent by email. It does not have to be a masterpiece. It can be a quick one or two paragraphs expressing your intent um, and desire to be considered for the open candidacy, uh, for the open seat. So that date again is 1222. Yes, it is an aggressive date. Um, it's an aggressive date because we have an aggressive agenda because there's a lot going on. Um, not the least of which is uh, the commencement of interviews in January um, for um, the position of permanent superintendent of the Cherry Hill School District. And ideally, um, we will have a full board for those discussions. So yes, we are moving uh, aggressively. Um, so that is the date to keep in mind. Interviews um, for those selected for interviews, and we don't know how many will express interest, hopefully a lot. Um, will take place on January 23rd. If there are any adjustments in any of those dates, they will be uh, they will be published. So you will know about that. That is my one item for new business. Seeing no no others, are there any items of old business that any board member would like to address? Seeing none. I had some comments which were old business and since they come right before second public comment it's appropriate now to address those consider it old business consider it pre-second public comment we are now at the point where we will invite uh, members of the community again to come to the mic for second public comment it does not have to be an agenda item it does have to be an item of relevance to the cherry hill school district to the schools um, an item within the purview of the Board of Education of Cherry Hill. The last uh, meeting, there were a couple of community members whose comments, um, because they did not relate to the operations of the Cherry Hill School District, those comments um, were not permitted. Those comments were not censored. It was not appropriate for those comments to be placed before this microphone at this meeting of our meeting of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. So 
Those comments are perfectly appropriate on a private page. They are not appropriate in this limited public forum. Members of the community who have concerns about matters before the school board are absolutely welcome, always welcome to express those. We are not here to determine issues that have nothing to do with the school board. So matters across the bridge that do not involve the Cherry Hill School District are not appropriate for this forum. Feel free to send those comments, concerns, as you always can to the superintendent, to the president, to the rest of us by email or any other matter, but not at this microphone. Comments that demean our students, our administrators, or imply nefarious behavior will not be tolerated. Feel free to attack your keyboards later. Not this microphone, not here, not tonight. Public comment is frustrating sometimes. We recognize, we understand that because it is not a dialogue, it is difficult sometimes to express an opinion and not have a response. Do not take a lack of response from members of this board or administration as a lack of concern. Do not take a lack of response or silence as a lack of concern, regardless, wh wh whatever matter it is that you want to bring to the, to the microphone tonight or any night. And we've heard that. There are a lot of familiar faces in the room. I'm glad to see them here. I'm sure there are a lot of familiar names online and I'm glad that they are there because we want to hear voices. We want to hear concerns as long as they are relevant to the school district. Concerns, complaints about Curriculum, completely appropriate. Gives us an opportunity to hear community voice, which we know is important. And we want to solicit that, we always do. But if it has nothing to do with the school district, it's not appropriate in this meeting. For those in the community who have also taken silence on certain matters as the board not caring or not getting it, that's unfortunate. I can't speak for the, for the rest of the board members. I'll speak for myself personally. When it comes to uh, matters of tension in the community, whether it be anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, I don't need to be told what that is. I grew up in a community where there were very, very, very few Jews. I am Jewish. I grew up in a community where people would ask me, what do Jews even believe? I get it. I know what it's like. I was the coach of the JCC Maccabi team in California. Our team couldn't go anywhere without armed security. None of the delegations could go without armed security. None of my team's parents could attend games without having their backgrounds checked. I understand anti-Semitism. I understand the importance of security. I have prosecuted actual neo-Nazis. I understand anti-Semitism. My great uncle's last name is Imber. His first name is Naftali. For those of you who don't know the name, he is the writer of the Hatikva. I understand. But when I see a student wearing, whether it's a kafia, a hijab, a kippah, a talus. I recognize those. I know what they mean. I know how important that is to them, to their identity. But what I also know is the color of their eyes, what they want in their futures. And I hope that we as a board and that the administrators and the staff can provide that. I also hope that we as a community can move forward, that we can turn the page. This is the last meeting of the year. It's been an amazingly positive year for the students and the staff of the Cherry Hill School District. So many wonderful things have happened. So few of them are talked about. So few. Because of the tension, which is understandable, but we need to move together. We need restorative practices. So come to the microphone. 
That's why you're here. We want to hear what you have to say if it is related to the Cherry Hill School District. That's why we're here. With that said, public comment is an opportunity for the community uh, comment on matters relevant to the operations of the Cherry Hill School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on, rel on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, statements which demean individuals or groups or, or which are irrelevant to the operations of the Cherry Hill School District will not be allowed. They won't be permitted. Community members who would like to present that information may do so. An email to the board president, to the superintendent, to board members, or using any other means. I don't believe there are any students in the room. We will check online in case the homework is done and any students would like to speak. If you're online and you'd like to speak, and if you're a student, put an S next to your name so we know that, and we'll, we'll put you at the top of the queue for those that are online. I don't see any right now. Uh, so we will start as we traditionally do uh, in the room. So if you're in the room and you'd like to make a public comment, um, please come to the microphone, uh, give us your name and the town of where you live, not your address, um, microphone's yours. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Eugene Brusilovsky. I live in Cherry Hill. <clears throat> I'm a statistics professor at the University of Pennsylvania and a father of two preschoolers who will be soon starting kindergarten in Cherry Hill. Uh, it was very encouraging, Mr. Mayor, to hear your comments about anti-Semitism and also very encouraging to hear presenters today talking about restorative practices in the Cherry Hill School District. Uh, so what I'll, uh, what I'll say is some disturbing, tra disturbing trends that I've seen nationwide and how they apply to the Cherry Hill School District specifically. So uh, I'm talking about the alarming trends and perceptions among our youth regarding the Jewish people, the Holocaust, Israel, and anti-Semitism. So recent statistics from YouGov and Harvard-Harris polls paint the picture that requires our educators' immediate attention and action. According to YouGov Economist survey, a distressing 20% of young Americans believe that the Holocaust is a myth and 23% believe that it has been exaggerated. This ignorance about one of the darkest chapters in human history is deeply distressing. Compared with older Americans, a substantially higher percentage of these young adults also believe other anti-Semitic canards. For example, 28% of young adults between 18 and 29 think the Jews have too much power in America. Also, in a recent Harvard-Harris poll, an astonishing 67% of young adults perceive Jews as oppressors and agree that they should be treated as such. The results get even more grim when asked about their views of the world's only Jewish state, Israel. Half of the young adults in the poll support Hamas, which is a terrorist organization over our democratic ally in the Middle East. These staggering statistics are not just a reflection of anti-Semitism, but indicate a broader issue of misinformation and prejudice being ingrained in our youth. We have a duty to counter these dangerous uh, narratives in our schools. And personally, I know this all too well, having fled the USSR as a Jewish refugee. Let me just, let me just ask quickly, if you tie this to the operation of the Cherry Hill School District, I understand yes. your, yep. your concerns, yep. but talk so, about the schools. No student should come out of Cherry Hill schools holding these dangerous anti-Semitic views. And every teacher needs to receive adequate training and supports to make sure that these views are countered as early as possible. It goes without saying that it's absolutely unacceptable for us to have any teachers, counselors, or other staff who hold these views themselves. We need to make sure that our curriculum includes accurate, in-depth studies of history, particularly the Holocaust, to educate our students about the realities of these events and the importance of tolerance and understanding in our world. Students also need to receive accurate information about the founding of the modern state of Israel, the fact that Jews are indigenous to Israel and not colonizers, and that American Jews are in no way, shape, or form responsible for the events in the Middle East. As a statistician, I'm happy to provide any uh, support with doing polls of Cherry Hill students if you see that this is an important thing to do. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We will go to the line. First name, Janet Hung. 
Good evening, Janet Hung, Cherry Hill. As we come to the end of two, uh, 2023, I'd like to take a moment to express my thanks to the many unsung heroes of our school district whose support is much needed and appreciated. Thank you to Linda King and the Transportation Department. This is a small but mighty department of four individuals managing nearly 700 daily routes and now adding preschool routes to their workload. The bus driver shortage, endless construction and traffic delays create unforeseen challenges and I appreciate your daily efforts to support our students and families. Thank you to Melissa Conklin and all the SAC uh, staff for keeping our SAC students safe and busy. Thank you to Mark Plavinsky and the technology team for all the technology support of our students, teachers, and staff. I truly appreciate your support of live streaming of the Board of Ed meetings, town halls, and the Zone PTA candidates forum as it allows our community to virtually participate in these meetings. Thank you to Caitlin Mallory and the special ed team for supporting the needs of our special ed students. Thank you, thank you to Siobhan Carter and the registration team for aiding our newest students and families in their transition to the district. Thank you to Mike Barrow and the athletic department for keeping our middle and high school students uh, sports uh, running smoothly. Thank you to Tony Saparito and the campus police officers for keeping our students and staff safe. Thank you to curriculum and instruction team for maintaining curriculum uh, through needs through the student-centered innovation and academic achievement. Thank you to our public information officer and department of one, Barbara Wilson, for keeping our school community informed. Thank you to Diane Lieber and the HR department, facilities, print shop, purchasing in various departments. While these departments do not interact with community, they are an integral part of the daily operations of our district. Thank you to Mrs. Sugars for your continued stewardship of the bond referendum projects. With the roof work over the summer in the 10 buildings, the dry buildings after rainstorms this fall was much appreciated. The renovated playgrounds at Malberg, Payne, Hart, and Stockton will be enjoyed, and the classroom and hallway work at Rosa looks fabulous. I'm excited to see the progress of the APRs additions to Kingston, Barton, Sharp, Knight, Horace, uh, Horace Mann, and Johnson. And I am personally elated at the forthcoming East Stadium improvements. The opportunities are endless for our student athletes, school spirit, and community. Thank you to Dr. Morton and the Board of Education for your vision and efforts in expanding preschool in Cherry Hill to include many of our youngest learners. Thank you to Dr. Mayhand, Caitlin Mallory, Danielle Edwards, Linda King, and the registration for all your efforts taking undertaking this Herculean task of rolling out high quality preschool programming in Cherry Hill in this condensed time frame. Thank you to the Board of Education, district administrators, building principals, teachers, nurses, to support staff um, for your commitment to our children. And thank you to Mrs. Elmar Stratton and Mrs. Fleischer for your service, leadership, and dedication to our school community. You will be missed, and I look forward to your continued advocacy for our families. Thank you, and wishing everyone a happy and healthy new year. Thank you. We will go to the microphone in the room. Name and town, please. Alani Aris, Cherry Hill. Um, I want to jump on the thank you train and I want to thank the Kilmer staff, um, especially the principal, the guidance counselor, uh, the teacher of my student who had an issue at school. She was excited to teach her class about Hanukkah, um, brought her menorah to school. Um, a student made a comment that she didn't like. She uh, said something to the EA that was present as her teacher was absent. She came home from school very upset. We called the school at 4, 3.45 on a Friday. We received a call back at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon into someone's weekend telling us what would the steps would be taken and everything. I know there's been an issue at Kilmer with turnover and principal and administration there. Um, there hasn't been great camaraderie. And I just wanna say you did a great job hiring the principal because she's amazing. She calmed our fears. She did everything we wanted and what we've wanted at that school since we started there five and a half years ago. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to the line. Next name up is Carolina Bevid. Hi, Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. Um, I just want to express some sadness that uh, Stockton's winter concert was today and uh, my third grade son was performing for the first time and my fifth grade son, my fifth grade son, sorry, fourth grade son performing for the first time. Fifth grade son had actually a duet with another student and no one 
was there from their family to support them or to cheer them on. I think it's only fair that if I have to listen to my fourth grader practice his trumpet at home, I should definitely get to see him perform on it. Um, I just don't see a reason why parents can't be included in the holiday concert, the winter concert. It's a festive time of year. I know parents with children at other schools, they really love the winter concert. It's um, it's a great experience for the kids and the parents. I really wholly hope that next year, parents will be allowed to be included to attend. Um, with my remaining time, I'd like to read a comment for Charles Goldberg, who cannot comment because he's working. Um, this is his quote. A person's trauma is never their fault, but it is always their responsibility. The problem here is that without significant consequences, behaviors are doomed to repeat. Conflict resolution only works if both parties see each other as human and are willing to communicate. When we talk about anti-Semitism, there are constant examples of Jews not being seen as human. Thank you. Thank you. We are in the room, Mr. Short. We're not going to start the clock yet. Um, I see you've brought a prop, which on its face has absolutely nothing to do with Cherry Hill School District. So I'm just going to simply ask you at the beginning of your comments, if you or let you know if you can't tie that into the district, to the operation of the district, it's not appropriate. If you can, that's why you're here. If not, and I will also thank you to keep it facing here, not at the crowd. Someone in the crowd asked me to say it, so maybe they should put say it, it down until and unless you are sir, able. Sir, you're not telling me what to do. Yeah, actually, I am. Oh, you are. Okay. Can you please tell us how that relates to the Cherry Hill School District? It's part of my speech. Start the clock. Rick Short, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Mr. Greenball. I'll be sending you an email. I've worked over three or four months on it. I hope you override these people. I hope you put students first because the theme of my speech tonight is they don't care. Um, it has to do with school security and I hope you do the right thing and I hope you challenge the district because it's my opinion that they don't care. You know, I've stood up here now three or four times. I've made new Islamic friends. I've made new Jewish friends. And everyone's here for the same reason. Because Dr. Morton is failing to teach. It's my opinion. It's my opinion Dr. Morton is failing. Can I say that? Okay. Again, interrupting me. <sighs> Here we go again. I stand here because Dr. Morton's plan is 19 lawn signs, 400 no hate t-shirts, and two bus trips. That's his plan. My friends behind me want education of their children. We need to meet in the middle. The people behind me keep asking the same thing. I have a different technique of asking it. They're very kind to the district. I see what's happening, and I see how hate is growing. I mean, hate has been failing here in two th since 2016 and 17 and 18. You've had these no hate signs. I guess they don't work, huh? Maybe education would work. Now, let me move on. On, excuse me, what did you say? Um. On um, November 28th, uh, Dr. Morton made a comment after a person went to public speaking. Uh, the person said that there was a, Black Lives Matter was a no hate group. And at the end of it, uh, the, the speaker also commented that they loved DEI and everything else. Um, so it'd be great to know if Dr. Morton thinks it's, I believe it, he says it's fantastic or uh, brilliant uh, to have that Black Lives Matter is a no heat group because he, he did say that. Um, the, the, the speaker did say that. Now getting to the restorative justice thing. All we're doing with restorative justice, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to end up with a bunch of uh, uh, basket case kids 
You're telling me a fifth grader uh, is really going to work through. All right. Thank you. I'll be back again. Thank you. We will move on to the next caller on the line. The last four digits are 788. If you would kindly give us your name and municipality. My name is Jeff Potowitz and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It was brought up in the last meeting that citizens were comparing Cherry Hill School District to Moorestown when it came to, to the education of our students. Theoretically, with a lot of rain, ratings, they are much higher than we are. And in effect, was, what, was, what was kind of said was that when you look at Moorestown and other school districts, they're paying their teachers or new, te new hirees significantly more than we would be and we we are and that's that's creating a problem so what we need to do is is and maybe justifiably we need to pay more higher salaries and higher benefits to get the teachers okay um a couple of years ago we passed a bond principal and interest 500 million dollars around that or a half a billion dollars and one and the principal alone was about 363 million one reason we had to pass a bond was and we were told this and maybe rightly so i don't know that that we needed a bond so large because we were all putting all funds towards the education of our children those k-12 through students and preschool students with, dis with disabilities that was very very important because and we were kind of kind of really not really focusing on 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 our buildings and other items and maintenance and so that's why we did that um well when we look at you you look at the user-friendly budget right now and more uh, morristown versus cherry hill uh, morristown total school tax rate is 1.8058 cherry hill total school tax rate is 2.409 or about 30% higher, which means now that 30% higher would probably equalize it. If, 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 what I'm saying is why are, why are we 30% higher than they are? And we are, I mean, we are paying our taxes. We are giving the school district quite a bit of, our, quite a bit of money, tax dollars. I understand the numbers, and um, are we just inefficient? What's the problem that we need to pay 30% more, that's the total tax rate, than Morristown, but they appear to get a lot more there? And that's my question. Those are the numbers. I could give you more numbers, but those are the numbers. And it's not only Morristown. It's Haddonfield. The difference is even, is, is, is even greater than that. Um, so I don't think we're having to I think we're more Morristown, but we're paying like we are. Otto, it's, your time is up. Thank you. We will return to the room. Are there any other members of the community in the room that would like to make a public comment? Feel free. Timer. Okay, there you go. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Janam Salem. I am uh, chair, from Cherry Hill. Uh, I had uh, a couple of uh, comments. Um, the re the restorative uh, program you were mentioning, I, I really just wanted to commend you guys on that because I thought I kind of, it kind of spoke to my heart. And I, you know, I, I would really wish and hope that you, that since it was so successful in West, um, maybe if it's more aggressive in East, that would help. <laughs> I really, I, you know, I was very, very, you know, shocked about that. I said, wow, that, that does, that does, you know, lower the, um, instances of bullying and, and I thought that's that's a wonderful program if you guys could continue that and just be a little bit more aggressive in East that would be wonderful you know I, I felt like it, it really spoke to me in particular I don't know if you guys were but it did um, I also wanted to ask a little about the committees I know that you have a few committees and there were some comments made on Facebook but I don't know about the the culture committee um, your strategic planning committee I'm just wondering if um, as community members, are we allowed to sit in 
on those meetings? Can we come in and sit? I just, I really just was interested because we're kind of, we don't really know about how you guys function in those committees. We, we just want to be more informed, honestly. Um, we're not here, there to heckle or anything. We just want to be informed, honestly. And then um, I was truly going to be done with, with what I was uh, about to speak about, but then um, something crossed my mind. Um, as one of the speakers had, had said, um, you know, the district does uh, have a very, very um, complex and structured uh, education about the Holocaust. And I read it with my children. I read Eli Wiesel's Night. I read The Boy in Striped Pajamas. I cried. I'm a Palestinian. I would never say that the Holocaust didn't happen. I don't know where that comes from. That's ignorance. But um, to equate that and just be fair, because the Palestinians have also had a very, very difficult plight. Maybe teach about the Nekba, because that is something that is historically accurate, and it did happen. And I think, especially in these tumultuous times, you know, um, just having that education and knowing that there are people who have suffered as well and are suffering still till today would probably um, just give people more of an idea of what we're going through and 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 not, you know, just see us as people who are just, you know angry <laughs> for no reason. I, I would hope that maybe the district could consider that just to make it as equitable for all the students, you know, in, in the Cherry Hill School District. If you would take that on, that would be um, extremely, I think, helpful for most, especially my, my children. I mean, my children and Muslim children in general, and all people should know about these things in history, honestly. You know, thank you guys again, and I appreciate, you know, all your time. Thank you. We will return to the fabulous internet and Laura and iPad. And I'm here in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I thought I had changed my name, Joel, but guess not. So um, I listened avidly to what you just said about public speech at the mic tonight, Mr. Mayor. But I am really confused and I'm hoping that Mr. Green can clear this up at some future point. But I do know that the freedom of speech includes the right to use certain offensive words and phrases to carry political messages. That's Cohen versus, I think it was Califor, um, 403 U.S. 15, 1971. But the government can limit some protected speech by time, place, and manner restrictions. But it generally involves requiring a permit for the meetings, rallies, and demonstrations but cannot be unreasonably withheld nor denied based on content of speech. So I am really, really confused when the statement is read at every meeting as to what is allowable anymore. I do believe at the last public meeting that there was a reference to something that was indeed part of our curriculum. Whether it was said in the proper manner, I cannot speak to. So I am really concerned that we're limiting freedom of speech when it should be freedom of speech. Um, as a board member, you know that you have to have really broad shoulders to sit there sometimes and to do things. But if you hear things that are not true, then it's up to you as a school district, particularly your school board president, to at least get it out there on your public media site, the Cherry Hill Public Schools website, okay, and dispute it. I mean, I, I would not be against that. All right, but I think there's a lot of confusion here now. I think there's been a lot of rudeness to people, which I don't appreciate since you're the board members who set the example for the rest of the community. Um, sometimes it's a no-win situation, even for me listening here at my home. Okay, so at, at some point, I'd really like to know what I'm really gonna be allowed to say, because quite frankly, I don't think it's clear. Um, the other thing is, I'm going to go back to the fact that you asked you know, us to email you. I really, I hear you, Mr. Mayor, but quite frankly, when people ask questions of this board at this microphone, the answers are never given in a public forum. I don't operate that way. I, if I ask questions, I'm asking for a reason. So I would appreciate moving into the new year with a new school district, you know, that we find another means of communication um, and into getting questions answered. I asked some valid questions tonight on items that you were voting for, and there was absolutely no response and with some of those questions there could have been. And I sincerely hope the resolution for this Board of Education, 
regardless of who's on it, is that we have full nine member participation in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We will return to the room. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak in the room? Omar Rashid, uh, Cherry Hill. Um, so I wanted to take the, a moment to speak on the importance of mental health in our school district. Uh, so in a 2021 report, 32% uh, of students in New Jersey aged 13 to 17 had an anxiety disorder and almost 15% suffered from a mood disorder, including depression. Uh, according to a recent study that was published earlier this year, the rates of depression are almost three times as high when the student is suffering from bullying versus not. Uh, I say this to highlight the recent increases in Islamophobic incidents in the Cherry Hill School District, uh, which is highly concerning. Um, any form of hate or racist behavior is highly concerning. Uh, Islamophobic uh, incidents occurring on a weekly basis is not acceptable. Our kids deserve better. No child should be harassed or bullied because of factors outside of their control. Um, I was happy to see in Cherry Hill's first release statement uh, that they were ready to support students of Jewish descent uh, with counseling and mental health services after the events of October 7th. Uh, this is extremely important, and I commend the school board for this attention to detail. Uh, I implore the school district to also remember the other charges, students of Arab descent, Muslim heritage, and Palestinian identity. Uh, but let's be clear, any student of any creed, race, or ethnicity may see the disturbing images circulating widely online of the death and destruction in Gaza. Uh, these will be highly traumatic for any young person to see and may detract from their ability to participate actively in lessons, perform well on exams, uh, and feel present in their day-to-day -day life, even if they aren't being bullied for the way they look or dress. Uh, it's important to restrict social media use. It's impossible, sorry, to restrict social media usage in the day-to-day, -day, in, in this day and age. Um, so I implore the board uh, most earnestly to release a new statement encouraging all students to access their mental health resources. Uh, furthermore, I would like to gently remind the board that addressing Muslim students and Palestinian students in particular in their statement would go very far in rectifying some of the negative emotions students may be feeling at this time, such as estrangement from the Cherry Hill community, uh, due to their identity, a factor no human can control, and one that should never limit a person's access to dignity and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back online. The next name, Howard Yaris. Good evening, Howard Yaris, long-term resident of Cherry Hill. I don't have a complaint. I don't have a criticism. I just want to say thank you to the school board and in particular to the instrumental music department of Cherry Hill High School East. Last, when, last week, my wife and I attended a short concert at the Cherry Hill Public Library. It was great. The students were allowed to leave class for probably two hours and perform in small groups. The music was great. The students were very professional in their presentation. And I hope that this wasn't the last performance of this type. I would love to see more cooperation between the school district and the Terry Hill Public Library. Thank you. Thank you. Let's return to the room. Is there anyone left in the room that would like to make a statement? Come on up. Hi, my name is Michael Perry. Uh, I live in Terry Hill. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about different topic. Uh, in the stand, uh, all uh, Islamophobia, but uh, wanted to talk about uh, crossing guards for our schools. Um, specifically, I was taking my my son goes to back middle school, and I was taking him to school this past Monday, and I understand it was raining. And 
um, and I see this for s three years now, there is not enough crossing guards on on the streets. Uh, I I was sitting in the traffic because it was raining, and a couple kids were crossing, and they were almost hit by a car. Um, uh, and when I came closer to to the school, uh, there was a crossing guard there, but he was sitting in the car. So I don't know how this work. Uh, I think we need to do something about this. And I see this, like I said, for three years with my uh, youngest son. So I hope in the new year, you'll, you'll do something about this. And because we need our children safe and go to school safe and come back from school safe. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to the line. The next name, I mean, Ahmad. Yeah, my name is Amina Ahmed. Um, I'm a Muslim School Justice Advocate for UCLA and Cherry Hill, um, working with a lot of the uh, students that attend school here. Um, I, I just wanted to say it, it was very, very heartening to hear the restorative practices um, presentation and all the success that it's had in the schools where it's been uh, implemented. Um, and even the manner in which it's being implemented with daily um, activities that cue students into the types of um, character building that we're all looking for. Um, it, it was really encouraging to see and hear about that. Um, I, I, I know that um, they presented um, the statistics of the actualized benefits at West, um, and that's a big gain. I, I, and I, I think that there's a lot of credit owed and there's a lot of appreciation owed there. Um, so I, I know that um, the presentations were specific to certain schools where it's been implemented with a lot of enthusiasm. So I'd like to um, pivot to, to ask about, um, could the same enthusiasm be adopted for the rest of the district? I know um, Ms. Winters was um, speaking along the same lines. And um, so really just echoing her comment and, and just um, asking about, you know, it would be wonderful to hear about the successes of this program, uh, if it is being implemented at East, at Beck, at Rosa, et cetera. I know I've been speaking to a lot of parents and students um, who are talking about incidents that uh, and experiences that I think would truly benefit from um, the implementation of this program. Um, and then uh, a second question about restorative practices. Um, two words kind of came to mind um, to have maximum impact. Is this program dynamic and is it responsive? Um, and what I mean by that is that, is it a static curriculum that is taught to students um, where the lessons are pre-prepared and teachers and um, staff members deliver the lessons or is it dynamic where um, uh, staff and teachers res are, are responsive to what's and um, appreciative and knowledgeable about what's happening in the student body, what are the current trends and um, shifts and take that into account and incorporate that into their lessons. Um, I think we'd all agree that that would have greater impact and it would have, um, it would really be true to the philosophy of the program. Um, I just wanna um, also ask about um, the implementation of that program. Um, how is it made equitable to different demographics of students within um, the school that it's being implemented in? Um, a, 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 restor a restoration after a certain incident could look different depending on um, what what was experienced. So um, is there thought given to um, what is the student's experience of, of our understanding of, of restoration, meaning how do they see restoration um, and are we sensitive to that? Um, thank you. Thank you. Let's return to the room. Any other community members wish to speak? Good evening. Uh, I know it's late, so I'll try to keep it a bit short. Um, good, I wanted to ask about the um, right, just, just name and municipality. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Eric right. Tien, I'm a parent and resident of Cherry Hill. Um, I wanted to ask about the Cultural Proficiency, Equity, Character, and Education Committee, or I believe it's CPs for short. Um, the five-year plan laid out by CPs to promote diversity amongst Cherry Hill schools has done a great job of addressing racism. 
as this plan was made during the 2016-2017 school year. I assume executed from there as a start date. We should be due for another five-year plan soon. Um, browsing the online resources on the Cherry Hill Board of Education website, it's not clear how the community can apply to be part of this process. I'd like to request that the board update their website to properly reflect how this, community, how this committee is appointed, how a member of the community can apply when it plans on creating a new five-year plan, and how that five-year plan will be developed from A to Z. Considering the rocky political climate we are in today and the obvious impact that it's had on the behavior of students at school campuses. I believe this is a good opportunity to incorporate anti-religious discrimination into the next five-year CPs plan. I understand that this technically already falls under the umbrella of CPs as a whole, but we clearly need to do more when it comes to topics like Islamophobia, which is shockingly prevalent in our community today. I'd also like to ask the board what CPs has done to combat what is going on today, and mostly because I have not heard them mentioned during any of the, during any of the board meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back online. Next name, Penina Mint. Hi, Dr. Penina Mint, Cherry Hill. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, first item is to um, hopefully for the board to consider um, having your votes uh, either by, by voice or by hand so the public can know how you voted on each one of the items. Uh, it is hard for us to understand how the votes are always unanimous if we don't see how you voted on these items. So I would appreciate if coming the new year, uh, you can uh, start with a new policy to have a voice vo vote or a hand vote so we can see how you voted on these items. Um, the next thing as far as restorative justice, um, I'm, I'm imploring the board to do a lot more uh, research on the topic of restorative justice and understand that the is actually the dismantling of justice altogether, where uh, Western civilization justice is founded on the concept that justice is blind. If you commit a crime, you are judged by the crime that you committed. It is your individual responsibility for that crime. What restorative justice argues, that justice can be relative to who is committing the crime. That means that justice is no longer blind. So I'm asking the board to reconsider uh, the restorative justice program and really figure out the consequences of instituted and experimental program on students that have no understanding of what it means to themselves and to their peers of uh, instituting a relativism system of justice, uh, meaning that no justice will be done. And lastly, I'd like to ask the board to consider uh, the end of the diversity, equity, and inclusion program, being that that is an ideological political program. It is fundamentally anti-individual. It's a dehumanizing ideology by classifying humans into two groups of oppressed versus oppressors. DEI has caused divisions, entitlements, and intolerance. It is incompatible with life, morality, truth, rationality, and the rule of law. Lastly, it is an ideology that replaces merit and agency with victimhood. It has provided cover for bigotry and anti-Semitism. I'm asking the board to consider. Dr. Mintz, Dr. Mintz, we will go back. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Microphone is all yours. John Starling, Cherry Hill, been here a few times. I appreciate your uh, giving us the opportunity. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, also offer words of thanks and gratitude to the board, as well as Dr. Morton, Dr. Perry, who's not here, 
as many of you may know, he announced this several weeks ago that there was going to be a meeting held uh, to discuss with the GCLA Muslims for Justice team to discuss uh, steps that would be taken to introduce increased staff sensitivity training, uh, hopefully to create a more inclusive educational environment for not only the staff, but the students as well. Uh, so we do want to thank you for that. We acknowledge uh, the hard work you've been putting towards that, and we certainly look forward to uh, seeing how um, that comes to uh, fruition, and we'll be looking forward to some feedback once the initiative is concluded. Um, and as the staff undergoes this uh, training, uh, we're hoping that um, they will see uh, the great value that it provides and, and push for a similar program uh, for the student body in a very uh, timely manner. I believe time is of the essence when it comes to uh, what's happening uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the conflict is continuing, though it may have faded from some new cycles. Uh, it continues unabated. And I believe it is uh, reshaping that region and is leaving lasting global scars. Uh, and that is impacting not only uh, parents uh, here, but also their students, which we are ultimately concerned about. And speaking as a religious leader in this community, um, I want to let you know um, the emotional toll that it is taking, uh, particularly on families that have lost um, loved, mem loved members of their family. Uh, we do have a woman in our congregation that to date since October has lost 54 members of her family. Um, and at this point in my community, um, if you don't know somebody if you don't have a family member that's been uh, killed in, in the conflict, then you are likely to know someone who does have a family member. Uh, and so it is having a tremendous impact. It's overwhelming our youth. We do have youth groups in which we are holding forums with to discuss their feelings and they're expressing feelings of over being overwhelmed, being exhausted, being worried and feeling isolated. And so, my hope is that the schools will take a very proactive approach to supporting uh, their emotional needs uh, during this time, especially when it comes to um, how these topics are addressed through whatever programs, whether it's the uh, second step or otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no hands online, we'll stay in the room. Going once, twice, come on up your last public comment I was trying at, at that particular microphone all right so Renee Shafin Cherry Hill as most of you know but I wanted to formally introduce myself um, I was sitting back there and as you could probably tell having a lot of things going through my brain wasn't sure if I was actually going to stand up here and say anything but at the same time figured I would take my last opportunity to speak publicly as a private citizen in the district and say that I am more than thrilled to be working with all of you in January. I was um, particularly inspired by a lot of the words that you were saying about your colleagues that are leaving, specifically around the inclusivity um, that uh, Ms. Fleischer promoted in the, in the board. And I would like to say that I have not felt so included yet in this board. I'm looking forward to what changes in the future, particularly from board leadership. I have yet to receive any correspondence formally welcoming to me to this board. Dr. Morton, thank you for your kind words and the rest of the district for your warm, warm welcome. Um, but that being said, I made a promise to come in with an open mind. And I do like to I would like to say that I am very open to working with all of you. Unfortunately, um, I won't be able to work with you, Miss Elmore Stratton, but thank you for your kind words in the past. And I'm looking forward to January and seeing where we can go um, in the future in the next three years. So thank you. Thank you. And publicly, welcome. And let's, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, no names are online. No hands are online. Plenty of names in the room. Yep. You know the drill. I think so. Um, you and I are still Cherry Hill. Um, want to start off with some concerns regarding the Malberg expansion. There's been some mis say miscommunication or just we're going through a massive um, evolution um, and we're playing catch up a lot of times. So it's always hard. Um, I was at the meeting at Malberg 
uh, when they had the big uh, town hall for uh, incoming families, there was a mention at that point they are looking to figure out a way to do SAC at Malberg in the next budget and things like that. But online, the FAQs say no plans. Um, but I also know the FAQs can be dated and things like that. And we're always playing catch up in a way with that. It takes a while to get things going. Our, so just wanted to put that out there. Um, I also was wondering with the upcoming expansion at Kilmer, will SPED classrooms be put there? Because um, right now, as a parent of a SPED student, it feels a little bit like my student is a second class citizen because we put so much pressure and expansion on for the full for our typically developing students, it feels like the SPED classes have been left behind and there hasn't been a lot of open forums to engage with the SPED parents to make sure that their students aren't feeling lost, their families aren't feeling lost, because there's times that we felt lost and Malberg hasn't felt about the school that it was. And we've had four of our six children, I had to do math on that for a minute, go through there <laughs> um, so far. Um, so just looking at that, um, I want to express my gratitude to Ms. Elmore Stratton for your service both rounds to this board in this community. It takes a lot to do it once you came back and did it again. Um, maybe you'll come back and do it a third time. <laughs> uh, but really you brought so much, the voice that you brought, and I know how hard it was being there and uh, what you've shared so openly during this last campaign. My family sincerely appreciates it. You and I both as lifers of Cherry Hill have that in common. We're not going anywhere and I'm gracious. Your entire family has put blood, sweat and tears into this district. You're a credit to their legacy. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do getting back to Chaka and hopefully building the next generation from there so that we can keep the cycle going. I also have been meaning to talk about this since November. I owe an apology to the BOE reps from the East and West. They put out an incredibly powerful letter in response to the community dialogue and what was going on at the high schools. That letter would never have occurred when I was a student in this district. There would have been zero administrative support for it. Neither principal would have let it happen. This is board, the student board reps were to be looked and seen and not talked to. You gave a report, your voice didn't matter. In the last several years through Dr. Malash and now through Dr. Morton championing this, that perspective has changed. And I am really proud to be in a community that values that and has put these dots just to be seen and looked to, but as active participants in these conversations, the leadership of Matt, Colin, and their other two compatriots, it matters. So I am gracious that our students have you to turn to. It matters. I'm gracious to Dr. Burns and Dr. Perry for running with it. And obviously Dr. Morton for all that you do and creating a space for your staff to understand how important the student voices, because as we say, every meeting, we're here for them. This is their future. We all went through our education. It's about building a positive education for them. Thanks. Thank you. No more name, no more hands online. Are there any other community members that would like to speak? Seeing one. Uh, Steve Redfern, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I figured I'd go last. Yanni always gets last. So I would like to publicly, um, I you know, Miss Fleischer, if she is listening, I apologize. I got here late, had to hear about the not so good basketball game that Cruzy had today before I came here. Um, publicly thank Mrs. Fleischer for her work on the board. Um, we got to know each other prior to her becoming a board member. Um, and I always appreciated her support of things that we were doing as CHA in the community, whether it was the Golden Age Prom or Volley for Support, whatever it was, she was always a constant there for us um, in support. This is Elmer Stratton, thank you. I appreciate everything that you have done um, with the Labor Management Collaborative. I'll say it again, just so the board can hear it, LMC. I look forward to those board member or members that would like to take the spot of Mrs. Elmore Stratton or Mrs. Fleischer as we continue this work. Um, Dr. Morton and I have been traveling the schools it's been positive, and I think it's the best path forward to have all voices involved um, to make decisions that are best for the students, the staff, and the entire community. Um, and we'll end on happy holidays. Just like that, a hand appears online. So we are going to go online. Sorry, there, we, do have, we do have a hand online. Um, the name is Barbara. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm Barbara Gluck from Cherry Hill. Um, I usually don't speak out at these things, but I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, I, I'm just kind of echoing the sentiments of the first commenter. Um, I think that people especially students don't realize how unbelievable our world, the Jewish world has turned since October 7th. Um, 
there is real fear in in our community. Um, there's real fear in the students. Um, there's acts that are being taken against the students, um, against our community, against members, um, people yelling at us, things in the streets, students at Cherry Hill schools yelling just because, you know, we look the part. Um, and I know that it was talked about, I've listened on on many board meetings, and I know it was talked about how there's gonna be put in place um, an anti-Semitism forum or a league, um, some sort of um, educational forum. But I think what's so crucial, especially in our days to understand that Zionism by any sense of the word, according to any definition, modern or historical, is literally just the right of return to our ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Um, it's always been our homeland dating back 5,000 years. We face Israel when we pray every single day. We include it in almost all of our prayers. It's land of our forefathers, our ancestors, and the land which we all came from. The Jewish people are from the land of Judea, which is now called Israel. It's in our name, it's in our soul, it's in our history. We, we, we have every single we, kind of scientific, archaeological, and oh, historical we recognize, proof. recognize that your initial comments were... So my the reason why I'm saying all this, it, I understand. The reason I'm saying all this is because um, I know we were talking about putting um, some sort of um, discussion or in place, um, but I really would think that it's very important to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance terms and the definition for anti-Semitism, which should include, which is on the government website and adopted by the U.S. government, denying the Jewish people the right for self-determination as an anti-Semitic act. So I, I, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you giving um, everybody their chance to voice their concerns. And I appreciate this time as well. And I know this is so crucial and so important because there's serious fear going on and serious issues. Thank you. Thank you. And we are back in the room. Hi, Susan Dermer, Cherry Hill. I want to thank Dr. Morton and the board for conduct for bringing um, IEC and conducting modern anti-Semitism sensitivity training with our teachers at East and West, and also for conducting Islamophobia training very soon with our teachers in January. I think it's very important for all our mem all our community members. Um, in regards to the teacher professional development um, that will be occurring in the high schools um, and the early dismissal. I just wanted to see if you were by any chance thinking of maybe doing instead of an early dismissal, a late in, like a, a later start time. I think that would be more beneficial for our students. Thank you. Thank you. We have no one online. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to speak? Seeing none, we will close public comment. And move along to our acting superintendent's comments, assuming there are any. Yes, I, I actually have a few tonight. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, so there, there was a comment made about um, my remarks toward a speaker on November 28th, where I referred to the speaker as, the speaker's comments as brilliant and outstanding. Um, I found that speaker uh, to be courageous as well. The speaker was a child, was one of our students um, who actually came and, and articulately shared his viewpoints, shared his perspective and shared his opinions. Um, when I was 17 years old, I wouldn't have done that in this setting. I absolutely would not have stood up and, and had done the same thing. Um, as a father, as an educator, uh, you know, I. I, I found that inspiring to see that young man to do that. Uh, for any community member to disparage that, you know, a child who stands before the community and expresses their viewpoints, I find that highly inappropriate and highly un unacceptable and, and highly, uh, it, it, it's offensive, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, that young man's comments were brilliant. They were outstanding. And they were courageous. I encourage you to go back and listen to them as well. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of, amount of uh, mis, 
um, communication and confusion around what we teach and why we teach it. Uh, in particular, there's been a uh, discussion around Black Lives Matter and if it's part of our curriculum and if you teach Black Lives Matter as a, as a curricular piece. And in actuality, Black Lives Matter is taught within a, within a history course uh, and it's covered uh, for its contextual reference in history. It's taught in our African-American studies course. Now, that African-American studies course covers uh, early African civilizations all the way down to modern times. So what happened with Black Lives Matters, all everyone could pretty much remember, uh, as part of a national protest and a national movement against pr police brutality, uh, Black Lives Matters was embedded into that. Irrespective of how you feel about Black Lives Matter, the event occurred. What we attend, intend to do is to allow our students to engage in critical thinking, to use those criti th critical thinking sk skills to uh, be exposed to information and allow them to make judgments about um, you know, opinions based upon their experiences and what they've learned and family values and things along those lines. However, the, the event occurred and it happened. And I'll give you a similar situation. So we also have a Holocaust and genocide course. It happens to, to land in our English department, but it covers a tremendous amount of history. As one might imagine, we cover Hitler and the rise of Nazism in that course, in that course as well. It's an important piece and important information for students to have context and for them to be able to understand what were the conditions that led to the, 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 the Holocaust, essentially. Um, it doesn't mean that we believe in Hitler and that we support Hitler or Nazism, um, but it, it's to provide information and context for our students. And, and that's what this is all about. And so when we ask for relevance, with you know, that's that's what we're speaking to. Um, Restore just a couple comments about restorative practice versus restorative justice. So restorative justice is a model that was more attached to uh, law enforcement and the, the the penal you know justice system. Uh, we're an educational institution, and it, it's not necessarily within our purview to see individuals be uh, criminalized for behaviors. Our, our children are learning. Our children are growing. You know we in, we intend to uh, partner and work with our families and work with our children as they develop. Uh, someone mentioned today that, you know, children's developmental stage, the brain's not fully mature until about 23, 24 years old. Uh, we're, we're helping to educate and help our, our children to grow uh, socially, emotionally, academically as well. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a clear distinction. Uh, restorative practices focuses on that educational piece. Restorative justice has is something, something separate. Restorative practice is an outgrowth of that, but they're, they're, they're different things. Um, yeah, absolutely, someone mentioned committee meetings. Um, absolutely, we, we encourage the public to come out to committee meetings. They, they are open for attendance. Um, we typically have a packed agenda, but if there's opportunities for dialogue with the community, um, you, you're open to, to have dialogue with the, um, with the board. Um, thank you for your comments about crossing guards. So crossing guards are township employees. They aren't school district employees. So. They are part of the police department's traffic unit. Um, so, you know, requests for um, additional crossing guards probably would be better suited at town council. Um, I have an opportunity to meet um, monthly with the chief of police, as well as with um, the mayor in town. So I can relay the, uh, the comments as well about crossing guards. Uh, last week, I had an opportunity to attend the uh, Israeli American Council's training over at High School East uh, on anti-Semitism and on modern day forms of anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it was outstanding. It was, it was truly fantastic. I thought the staff from East uh, received a tremendous amount of information. There was a great dialogue that took place. Um, staff is so large that they broke it into two days, the 12th and the 13th. Um, next month, we're gonna do the same with uh, Islamophobia. So we've identified a trainer to come in and we look forward to you know, educating the staff um, there as well as uh, spreading that training throughout the rest of the district also. Uh, just to mention late arrival versus early dismissal. I know the, the, late, um, the late arrival was preferred for us, but just understanding that our buses are staggered the way I drop off work. High school students are dropped off first, then we go to middle school students and then elementary students. If we do a late arrival, that would mean a 930 start it's right in, in the midst of uh, elementary drop-offs. Uh, so it would have created an imposition on elementary 
drop offs and it is just it's a situation we couldn't uh, tackle without hiring additional buses and additional routes which do not exist as Ms. Sugars would <laughs> will, will attest to. Uh, so it's least preferred that we do the early dismissal, but what's most important is that we wanted to afford teachers the opportunity to engage in, in professional learning community meetings. Uh, just two other items for me. Uh, preschool expansion. I, I want to I want to say thank you to all of our families for their patience. I, I know it's been very, very difficult. Um, and I apologize for, you know, any information that, you know, hasn't been shared um, as timely as we would like for information to have been shared. Um, we have been working at a feverish pace. Um, part of the feverish pace has included hiring additional staff members. Uh, there was a question about one particular title, a community parent involvement specialist. That is a, a new title and a new individual who will be coming to work uh, within the district as part of that uh, funding source. Um, also, we uh, approved a teacher coach this evening as well. So preschool instructional teacher coach as well. There are a number of other positions also, uh, but Dr. Mahan has been, has been working um, diligently trying to um, tackle her normal responsibilities in addition to you know the other responsibilities as it relates to getting us up and running um and it's been you know there, there, there have been some hurdles for us to jump through we believe that the benefits are so great that you know we're, we're willing to to knock down walls if we have to uh in support of our families uh but we we will get there and i just like to just thank everyone for their patience um again i wish everyone Every, you know, all families are peaceful, went to recess. Please take time for, uh, you know, rest, relaxation. If you're celebrating the holidays, uh, have a wonderful holiday. And Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Uh, we are almost at the very end. And at least one board member would like me to simply move on to take a motion to convene the second executive session, which we do have to go into briefly. However, instead, I'm going to annoy her because I know she will eventually forgive me. Um, so, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, as you leave, know that everything you have said, everyone you have championed, um, thanks you, needed you, still needs you, and will always hear you um, through the work of the board. Um, I have always tried personally to understand and empathize um, with um, communities of color, with communities that are not mine, with communities and cultures that I did not grow up in, and um, I, I do okay. Um, I have work to do as we all do, um, but uh, and I will continue as best I can to be their voice and your voice and their concern as we work through the various issues um, that inevitably come to us as a school district um, so that they can share in the promise of a future that um, should be available to every student um, regardless of their race, their culture, their religion. Um, you have been, as I said, their champion, but you've also been ours. Um, you have often um, brought things to the table that uh, many of us um, probably should have um, and for whatever reason um, did not and we have been able to tackle those and for that um, we're all thankful. Um, I wasn't kidding when I said I will miss um, the occasional unpredictable comment because they're sometimes entertaining but they are always important. Um, because communication, dialogue, um, and sometimes poking the bear is necessary, and sometimes you've done that um, respectfully, thankfully. Um, you have taken on too much sometimes. You have been um, the subject of criticism, which is wildly unfair. Um, we are all here to be criticized on occasion and accept that um, and work through that. Some, some that you have... Um, dealt with is not of that type and is unfortunate and hopefully we are helping to educate students to grow up in a very different way. But I will miss you. Um, 
And as annoyed as you probably are that I'm saying these nice things, I don't care. Because um, you deserve it. Um, you've had too many not nice things said about you. Uh, you will not have enough nice things said about you here tonight. Um, so for what it's worth, I'm glad I could start the balance back in the right direction. Um, feel free to flame me on text or otherwise, but you deserve to be thanked for everything you've done, for everything you've done for yourself, for your family, for your own children, for the ch children of this district uh, to help them um, have better futures. Thank you. Um, Are there any other? It's board super members? late, so let's not do any more of that. We need. Uh, I motion for Mr. second. Mayor, exec. please no, recognize no. me so I can speak. Thank you, Ms. Elmer the chair. Stratton. Uh, you know what? Motion for second exec. I don't hear that. I don't hear it. I second, hear no motion. Second. I'm intending no motions. Mrs. Winters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Elmore Stratton, I won't make it long because I know we all tired, but as anybody can tell you, ever since we found out you were leaving the board, I have literally been walking around saying, I don't know what I will do without her. I think I said, I know I said it to Dr. Morton. I know I've said it to Mr. Greenbaum. I believe I said it. I feel like I keep saying it to everybody. You are a champion of students. You are the queen of reminding us we need to do something about SAC in this district and get at those wait lists. You are the most knowledgeable person I have ever met about community partnerships in preschool. And I don't know how we will continue to move forward without the depth and breadth of expertise, professionalism and perspective you bring to this board. So, I'm going to shut up because you don't want me to say it all, but just know I have your cell phone number. <laughs> and when I am lost and I don't know what to do, hopefully you will still answer my texts. Thank you for everything. Mr. Greenbaum. So I'll keep this brief. I'm going to skip some prepared comments I have. I'm just going to say we've We've definitely gotten to know each other a lot better in recent months. We've had some really great discussions. You've really had a tremendous impact on our district, on our community, and you'll definitely be missed. Thank you. Dr. Root. It, it just wouldn't be fair if I didn't get to say something too, <laughs> right? Uh, um, I can't help but think about what a mistake it was that you weren't. Uh, chosen to be to sit on this board I full respect to all the people that were voted in I but people that didn't vote for you weren't paying attention to what you do on this board they weren't paying attention to the fact that you're involved in every HR uh, meeting how important you are to this district and that breaks my heart um, because I've listened to the things that you've said the community building that you do the the perspective that you bring and it's absolutely unique on this board and it's absolutely special in the fact um, uh, that you didn't receive the vote makes me very, very sad because I think you're just, if I could give you my place because you belong here so much more than I do. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, but I can't do that. But uh, thank you for your service so much. Mrs. Elmore Stratton, um, because you have also been the champion of student voice and student voice of our student reps, I am going to give our student rep the opportunity to have the last word. I'll try to make this as uh, long as possible. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, the, even since the first meeting, um, you were you were there as an as an advocate for student voice, and I really appreciated seeing that. Um, like as as someone who sees that not that many students come out to these meetings a lot, um, I really tried to make an effort to, whether it be an SGA or just the general school population, make sure that people are getting the word out, getting getting to know that this is a place that um, really wants to hear from students, really wants to hear feedback, and wants to hear what's going on in the community. So to see you from like the very start of my time um, on 
as as a school official like advocating for that was just very a very nice introduction to um my position here and i'm really gonna miss your presence here advocating for students as well as the diversity uh efforts and just all the the aspects that make every student feel like they're a part of our community can i motion for a second exec now what not, um <laughs> not, not quite yet so that's it we're at the done of the, the the end of our meeting thank you this is it for the year be safe Make sure your students, your children are safe, especially on New Year's. Let's all make sure we're back here for our first meeting of the year. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. And um, Mrs. Elmer Stratton, I will now consider your motion. Motion to move to second exec. Is there a, s for, for student matters. For student matters. Is there a second? No votes will be taken. There will be no action taken during that meeting. <laughs> I think she's leaving. She has another role. Um, is there a second? Dr. Rude. All in favor? Motion carries. Have a good night, everyone.